Good evening, everybody. This is Pete Morris. We are looking at the uh, Comanche Zoom for May 27th. This is the topic, flying with a pro pilot, autopilot. Greg Field will be yours. He's got quite a bit of time experience uh, flying with this, although it wasn't a Comanche, but that's all right. Uh, and he's going to be able to talk about it and answer questions and all that kind of stuff. And with that, we're back to our usual, you know, who you are, where you are, and what you fly, or continue the discussion that's already been going on. You can unmute and then go ahead and talk if you'd like, people. Everybody's got stage fright. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Derek Jenkins, uh, Manitoba, Canada, uh, 1961 uh, Comanche 250. I'm Pete Morrison, Connecticut. I have a 63 250. Go ahead and key your mics if you want and say who you are, where you are, what you fly, or we have a discussion about autopilots. Uh, if you have more comments to make, go for it. Oh, I just, I, I thought I had unmuted, but where were you from in Connecticut? I used to be based at uh, Danbury, EXR. I'm at uh, Danielson, right on the east side. Okay. Hey Pete, CJ, everybody. It's uh, Jim Worley. I'm uh, in Southern Virginia. I have a 61 uh, fuel injected 250. Uh, one thing I want to throw out there, I can't believe that I've been flying the Comanche for as long as I have, not as long as many of you, but, but about 12 or 13 years. And I haven't heard anybody ever talk about the pre Oshkosh air race, which I just found out about, accidentally stumbled across it. Uh, on the internet the other day. And uh, that is absolutely going on my bucket list. Does anybody else know about that or have ever taken part or taking part? Over. No. Worley, fill us in. Apparently, CJ, apparently it is something that they've been doing forever. It's on the, it's on the first you arrive on Friday before Oshkosh starts at another airfield that's up in Wisconsin, but not Oshkosh. And they have like a hangar party on Friday night. They, everybody gets ready and just, they have like a, an open house at the airfield on Saturday. And then on Sunday, they have all these different, and they have all these different uh, levels of airplanes. So the one that we would, at least I would fit into, or all the single commanders would fit into is production, uh, you know, certified 249 to 274 horsepower retractable gear. That's the classification that we would race in. And they do a, you do a course and I, which I, and they don't tell you what it is beforehand and they don't tell you how long it is beforehand, but they do a course and it's up to you to fly, you know, whatever altitude you want and figure it all out. And then, and then you land at the end, and and then at the end of the whole thing, everybody flies over to Oshkosh and parks. And they hand out awards, and they hand out all the awards and everything, and I think the first on the Monday of Oshkosh. And apparently um, they've been doing this, apparently they've been doing this for a long time, but you have to have all your paperwork in by 1 June. And so I was like, I can't make it happen this year, but it's going on my bucket list for next year. You know what? You are now officially tasked with uh, leading the effort. I bet we can get a couple of Comanches. Love to get Charlie Horton in the Charlie's 400 with Melody and um, Helen Miller in the Miller Twin. She's an air racer. Pat Kiefer would probably be happy to <laughs> coach everybody. She's been an air racer. What yeah, do you think? It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll, ha I'll happily go find the information again and and, get, and broad, I'll probably, is it easiest to send it to you or Pat and so you guys can blast it out to everybody or whatever? How would you like yeah. to do that? Yep, send it to Pete. Would you be willing to uh, to, to take that and less for the yeah. newsletter? Yeah, uh, Jim, is there, a, is there a website or something that you can put the website? There is. The I, put that in the chat window. Uh, on the, yeah, I found it on the EA. I, I'm driving right now, so I can't put it in there, but okay. I will get it to you when I get where I can. Terrific, thank you.
Boy, the things you hear on Comanche Zoom. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm up in Vermont with a 1962-180 and, um, and then flying the family uh, uh, 260B and struggling through my own <laughs> uh, avionics upgrade that has been going on since late last year. So for all of the eternal annuals and for all of the eternal avionics upgrade projects, I join you. I feel you. Anybody else jump at any quiet moment and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly? Uh, Ed Cullen from uh, down here in uh, Texas at uh, South Lake. Uh, Hicks is a field that we're that I, that I fly my, my uh, 250 out of. Hey, CJ, is what's going on with the uh, FAA and Trio? Is is the FAA just completely wound out of shape uh, with what they're trying to uh, accomplish with this kind of like a reorganization up there? You know, you've actually come to the right Comanche Zoom to find out the answer to that. And the person oh. who has the most firsthand knowledge is gonna be here tonight. That's um, Mark Sullivan, a twin owner of over 20 years, a uh, uh, aviation attorney and one of the principals in the STC group that's moving the TRIO Pro Pilot autopilot certifications forward. Nope. And yep, so that is exactly uh, the the person that can best answer that question, other than the FAA itself. I don't know. The, I, uh, okay, I, I I agree with you, but I I'm not a real fan of the FAA. Right? <laughs> you know. I will say that um, the FAA did a kinder, gentler reorganization a couple of years ago, and they have genuinely changed in some ways that are super helpful to us as pilots. However, I think it's a little bit like that's a really big organization with a lot of branches, and the different branches seem to be um, going through their own you know how butterflies go through that really weird, ugly stage where they, they're like a really weird looking caterpillar and then they go into a chrysalis stage that's kind of crunchy and then they come out as a butterfly, you hope. Well, how, well, how, yeah. how did the uh, people at Garmin get, the, uh, get their whole system through? They, they must self-certify. There's some self-certification there. They're much bigger and they're going through a different process than the TRIO Pro Pilot. And the TRIO Pro Pilot process was supposed to be part of a program that was designed to improve safety by bringing over proven technology that had grown up and been uh, established solidly in the experimental community because they had done such uh, extraordinary things there. And a lot of stuff moved through really quickly. And, it, and then, um, it's unclear, the rumor mill is that Boeing happened where a lot of the sort of uh, the 737 MAX 8 and the lack of, I guess, well, I shouldn't talk because I really don't know the inside scoop on what happened with the Boeing, 30, Boeing 737 MAX 8. People like Zach Grant seem to have the bottom line there, but um, that series of really horrific incidents where you know, got everybody more careful is is apparently part of it. And then just some, um, that program that created the TRIO Pro Pilot and brought over some of the angle of attack indicators moved pretty fast and pretty successfully with, as far as I know, no bad stories, but apparently they just wanted to sort of look at, look at it and formalize it and and then I just don't know. This is where I want Mark Sullivan to uh, come and talk to us because I've heard everything from they had a, a software and computer upgrade to they had um, their engineers got real busy, busy at one ACO to, um, to uh, you know, to whatever. And all, all, I've, all I know that I can say somewhat reliable, reliably is the fact that the pro pilot is just adding one more uh, model to an AML, they got their stuff in before Garmin. There hasn't been any changes to the autopilot itself. And so this delay did get noticed pretty high up in the FAA as not as anybody had done anything wrong, but as it it's, a, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. 
Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Um, and and I, appreciate, I appreciate the fact that you, you dig into this, uh, you know, every time we get together to talk about it. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm not the person with the firsthand knowledge, and he will be here later on tonight. Um, just wanted to say a quick hello to Bob Ferris and uh, to who brought a, um, an issue to our attention and let you know that, Bob, we're looking into the... Um, the situation that you had installing electro air. And I hope to have more news for you uh, in a week or so. So I'm sorry for the slowness, but um, we haven't dropped it. And as you know, this, and this is just, uh, Bob installed electro air in a twin Comanche. And uh, you know, most people who have electro air rave about the system, but Bob had a really, really difficult install situation that, um, that really, I thought it was a very, very good thing that he brought it over and said, you know, this, this, can you <laughs> dig into this and go find out what happened? Just an introduction here, Joe Androsky here from Wanakee, Wisconsin, got a 65 260, and since 1983. So been around the past time or two. <laughs> You've had it since, when did you say you got it? 1983. Outstanding. Welcome and thanks for being here. And were you one of the people that found Pat Lee's uh, Comanche neighborhood cookout in uh, Osceola? Um, I, I heard about it on one of our meetings here, but we were had to, had to do something else. Yep. <laughs> but, but I would sure like to do that. And I signed, thought I signed up for them through uh, your uh, website. So we'll see what happens. Outstanding. He'll be having another. So if he's got your uh, if he's got your name, you'll be on the list for the next invite. It was a, apparently a really good time. How many of you guys, by the way, got a chance to dial up the ASOS at uh, Osceola, Wisconsin, or I is it Osceola? Osceola, yeah. Uh, the day of the the uh, Comanche neighborhood get together and fly in there to hear that custom message. They put a special message on the uh, on the ASOS that morning, actually the night before, to uh, welcome all the Comanche flyers. So that's it. The Piper Comanche became famous on that day. My name is Ken Edens. I live in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I'm just going to tell Martin I've probably got his sister ship. I've got a 65 260 that I've owned for about 35 years and 1700 total time on it. Holy cow. Welcome. And uh, it is the best thing to hear about people who've had their airplanes for decades and decades. Welcome and thanks for being part of us. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to putting, putting a Trio autopilot in if we ever get one. <laughs> <laughs> and we are too. Tom Pitts, Lovington, New Mexico, and I got a 66260B. Welcome and great bird. Thanks for being with us. And I own. And you were somewhat broken and unreadable if you want to retransmit. And welcome okay. to us. Okay. Is this any better? Uh, yes, loud and clear now. Go for Don't it. I don't know what happened there. John Putter, Orange, Massachusetts, has a uh, 1969 260C and have had it since 1987. John Putter, good to have you as always. Welcome. This is Ed Hash in Phoenix, Arizona. I have a 1959 Comanche 250 that's been in the family since it was brand new. Okay, you definitely get the, the gold star and grand prize. Welcome and thank you for being here. And it's great to hear of a Comanche that's been in the same family since it was born. My aunt took delivery at the factory in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, and she was a wasp in World War II. Oh my, I actually 
would love you to send an email to piper32p at gmail.com if you would. And again, it's piper32p at gmail.com if you would be willing to share that story. Piper32p at gmail.com. Yep. That's Pete Morse, the gentleman okay. who's welcoming you in with me. I'm Bill Hicks in Walsenburg, Colorado. I fly a PA24-260, uh, 1965 model. We've got a plethora of 65s on tonight. Welcome, Rob, Bill Hicks, and or, sorry, Rob Hicks. And thanks for being with us tonight. Hi, CJ. Mike Moran, Chico, California. Got a 67-260B. Uh, welcome. And I guess the Bs are the other well-represented type tonight. <laughs> 67 is awesome. Thanks for being here with us. Rich Bergman with another 1967-260B, Gillespie Field, El Cajon, California, with you tonight. And I'm like, I like hearing about all the bee, bee birds. <laughs> Absolutely. Rich, good to have you with us tonight. And uh, you guys have five Comanches on your field, if I recall. Uh, yeah, four or five, and uh, we're trying to count up the Comanches at Montgomery, which is the in San Diego airport, and we don't know how many are there yet. Pretty sure there's none at Brownfield, and there's a couple at uh, Palomar, so we're trying to get everybody counted up to see how many we really have. Oh, this is super. Um, part of what we want to do is the mapping technology that we've been creating here. Once we've got that and we can get people to add in not just themselves, but their fields, it's going to make it so easy to find each other and organize stuff. So we're looking forward to doing a Comanche Zoom in a couple of weeks to hopefully uh, introduce that as an unveiled mature or at least uh, ready, ready for prime time technology where everybody can start putting in their info, whether it's personal or business or as well as your recommendations of shops, uh, whether they're avionics or maintenance and other instructors. And as you may have heard, Will um, Chapman has been collecting a list of CFIs uh, and double I's, MEIs, et cetera, who own or have significant instructional experience in Comanches. That'll help us with owners that need transition training and, um, uh, and then just general instruction. I'll be throwing Will Chapman's uh, email address into the uh, into the chat window later. Yeah, uh, CJ. Additionally, uh, I'm in the San Diego uh, QB hangar, and we've been doing co meetings with the Palomar hangar. And uh, in just the, the present, the uh, attendance there, we've already identified four Comanche drivers. CJ, a uh, question? Go for it, Jim. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing CJ's picture. I'm seeing everybody else, but when CJ speaks, I'm not seeing her picture. I can't see what I've done wrong, but perhaps I've done something wrong. We're seeing you just fine. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm seeing everybody else, uh, all the other speakers I'm seeing, but um, I'm not seeing CJ. Well, every so often people like CJ versus uh, turns off the video because she has low bandwidth. And uh, okay, well, but uh, everybody has the option of, of being on screen or not. 
Yeah, fair enough. No, that's that's fine. Um, that explains it. I'm I'm down here in Oz. I got a two fifty, which and is having like, a major inspection at the moment. See, right now I can turn myself off. Oh yeah, you're gone. And then put me back on. Yeah, fair enough. I understand. Like a magician. <laughs> It's I like up in here. Whoops, I guess I can't. Go ahead. You first. I think Michael, you're up. Oh, I was just saying hi. I missed you guys the last two weeks. Been working on Thursdays and Thursday evenings, and I I feel like I've been gone a year. <laughs> well, that's why we record these things so you can come back and catch up. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> I had my uh very first uh, kind of in-flight emergency last Thursday, uh, last Wednesday, actually. Uh, we were uh, flying to California from Arizona to uh, our, our business partners. And um, we uh, went to our meeting. I, we get I actually kind of the scenario went like this. We, we were going to uh, we were going to a, a, an airport that was five or six miles past where we actually landed because I'm not instrument rated and it was it was beyond my uh, rating to go land there. So I ended up landing at Chino. And then we came back and we we're heading home around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. <clears throat> and my uh, mixture knob came off, my control came, the whole control came off in my hand as I was uh, departing the field. And um, I had no mixture control. So we ended up uh, having to turn back. I decided not to fly it. Not, I would love to get people's opinion tonight, just before we start, if I could have flown it home uh, with mixture almost full rich. That's a good question. I didn't. Uh, I was afraid that, you know, at up at altitude, I'd be fouling plugs and, you know, just burning too rich. And I could have, I could have stayed at a pretty low altitude but I wasn't willing to damage an already um, up there engine. And uh, I went back, I went back I aired on the side of caution. And, uh, you don't doubt yourself for doing that either. What's that? You never doubt yourself for airing on the side of caution. That was a good decision. Oh, I'm not doubting myself at all. I was just wondering if it would have been safe to fly at home. I got a couple of opinions already from some friends of mine down on the field, but. I, I didn't want to do it. So now I have a brand new mixture control and it's great. <laughs> Hi, CJ. Hey, welcome and good to see you. I am uh, glad that um, bad things didn't happen. You had an emergency that was relatively benign and you chose the cautious and prudent way out. I've had nothing like you've had, nothing. <laughs> you had some amazing, Amazing things happen. Um, my similar, somewhat related incident was um, having a carb, a carb, well, we thought it was a carb heat cable getting sticky and it turned out to have been a carb box, a carb heat box shaft, carburetor air box shaft getting really mm -hmm. sticky. And, um, when we finally diagnosed it, we realized we had just flown the poor bird all the way across the country uh, with essentially the equivalent of your carb heat cracked the entire way. Oh, wow. Um, obviously, it made it. <laughs> and yeah. it was making uh, book speeds, despite the fact that it was running a little rich. But um, I, I wouldn't want to do it again. So I, I agree with your decision. Yeah. Yeah. And no, um. <clears throat> You know, I, I'm, I'm a Mike Bush fan, and uh, it'd be fun to have him on. Have you ever had him on, Comanche? We Town? never have. And you know what? Zach Grant, um, obviously, one of the first Comanche Zooms was Zach, who rarely, rarely can get Thursday evenings free or he'd be here, talking about owner-produced parts. And I urge you all to go back and find that it's very, very early uh, 2020 Comanche Zoom, because this is such a critical method for us to keep our airplanes flying and it is a really generous program targeted just at people like us where the manufacturer isn't supporting our airplanes anymore that said 
um, the other area that we really wanted to talk about, uh, well, there's several of them, is um, owner preventative maintenance. And Zach suggested seeing if we could get Mike Bush to come and talk to us. He said he has got the best uh, discourse on that that he knows of. So if yeah. you haven't seen Mike Bush's seminar, um, Savvy Aviation on owner preventative maintenance, although we would want Mike to talk a little bit specifically to Comanches, which is not really his area of expertise. He's more of a continental engine guy and not so much light combings. Uh, we are hoping to reach out to him at some point and uh, and see if he'll come and talk. He does have a love affair with Continental Engines, and I see it seems like Continental Engines have their own issues with cracked cylinders and things like that, much more so than than Lycoming. And uh, that's that's the word on the street. Oh, um, oh. Is also that Continentals rarely make it to TBO, whereas Lycomings frequently do. Frequently do. I'm I'm. I'm technically a TBO, at least on the bottom end. And as far as the logbooks say, the entire top end was done about 700 and change ago. Yeah. So I'm at, uh, I'm technically at like 62 hours over TBO on this engine. And she's still running just beautifully. I mean, I watched the engine monitor like a hawk, you know, but cylinder head temperatures, EGTs, everything just looks perfect. I mean, it just I don't know how we ran our engines without an engine monitor. I have a, a JPI 930 in, in, the, in my Comanche. You can see it over there on the right. <laughs> you know, your panel is, I have to say that your panel is just there to make us all drool and have to go and get napkins for our Comanche Zooms, right? Yeah, you know, uh, that's very funny. It's really, um, it's a 430 WAS. It's a JPI 930 that was installed. These are all like 10 years old, um, The everything. It's got a 696 that's panel. Let me get out of the way here. The 696, it's a Garmin handheld that's panel mounted. Um, and that is integrated into the 430 WAS. And uh, there is a, I, I can't remember the part number for the, for the Aspen, but the Aspen talks to the Garmin and uh, does GPS, uh, GPSS steering. So the autopilot's very simple and it's very intermittent. I can't wait to get a new autopilot in the, in the Comanche, but um, it's a it's a very capable airplane. And I have that 696 is I've got XM weather radio uh, and XM radio. And um, I get METARs and TAFs and all kinds of weather information before I even get to the airport. It, it's really, it's it's very capable. Enjoy it very much. Awesome. Um, and everybody, feel free to jump in. We got a couple of minutes more before we start and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Can you hear me? Hmm? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, well, this is Chris Barber. Um, I'm new to this bunch. I've, I've watched every one of these Comanche Zooms, and um, you folks are critical to my whole thing. As a matter of fact, I got this plane. I love Comanches for. First one I flew was 40 years ago, it was 5053 pop, but maintaining it is my biggest problem. So the plane in the background of my picture is over in uh, Tennessee. And one of the reasons I bought that plane is because I think I'm in a good maintenance situation. I'm actually gonna have a hangar over there also and the mechanic's gonna live right around the corner. So maintenance is my whole thing. And I'm really glad to be part of this group. As for that beautiful panel, which I'm quite jealous of myself. Uh, you know, how do you get ADSB into that thing? We can see it. I'm, I'm finding that people are getting so dependent on that thing that I kind of have to have it just to keep myself from being run into, and, so, and vice versa. So I could have I could have gotten a Garmin, one of the Garmin uh, ADSB receivers, and had that integrated into the 696. It only has one port on it, so you can either choose to go to the Aspen. Or you can choose it to go to the, and the Aspen is a tiny screen. So, um, oh, sorry for that. Um, but you could get, if you have a Garmin ADSB, I, I think it's not the 375. Somebody help me with that because I don't, I'm not familiar with all the Garmin products. I have an uh, L9000 in there, the, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> sorry, it's slipping my mind. It's, you know, the senior moment. Not that I'm as senior as some of you who are, I'm amazed that you're 
flying and doing as well as you are. I, I hope to be in that category soon. Um, but the, uh, you know, as far as the ADSB goes into your 696, it, it, there's, there, there's a way to port it to your devices. Just what if it somehow the, showed up on your HSI? It can, it can show up on your HSI on your Aspen too, especially on the newer Aspens. This one can do it. This is a, a PFD 1000. Again, it's like almost, I think it's just over 10 years old. Uh, I, did, I did update it about two years ago. I had new software loaded on it. So it's got some of the cool, and it does have, um, it has, um, we call it uh, AI, um, augmented reality on it. So I can switch to that and actually see my approach path on it. It's, again, there, there's some cool things. It, it, this is what really sold me on this airplane. There were some things I, you know, Kristen actually, Kristen Winter, um, knew the previous owner of this airplane and I brought it to her. She's, she mentioned a few things that kind of was, she was steering me away from it, but I had looked at so many Comanches before I purchased this one that I was willing to tolerate some of the things that she wasn't willing to tolerate and get them fixed when I was here. <laughs> and you're clearly not so sorry, which is a, a beautiful thing. No, I'm not. And the fact that our airplanes are appreciating and, you know, really, I'm, I'm thrilled with the purchase. And I have Barbara to blame for it because she was a previous uh, Comanche owner with her, with her former husband. She said, if you're buying an airplane beautiful. for yourself, you go buy yourself a Comanche. And I, she wasn't wrong. Hey, CJ. Yes, Greg, hey, welcome. Hey, I got the link finally. Thank you. I am, yes, welcome and so happy to have you. Good to see you all again. It is great to see you. Uh, my name is Aton Spiegel. I have a 1965 Turbo Twin Comanche. I finally got it off the ground. It was stranded in, in uh, in, in Colorado away from me for a long time, but I finally got it home where it is now grounded again. So, <laughs> the, Phil Hicks was there, he saw me off. Eitan, thank you for saving that twin. And welcome, good to see you again. Good to all see right, you see all. So, Greg, if you're ready to get started, uh, we can uh, we can get into your presentation. Yep. And Pete, before we throw Greg into the deep end, I have a little bit of a quick uh, news update for some folks, for everybody, actually, and uh, a bit of an intro. Greg and I had talked last night about this because Greg didn't want to blow his own horn and his horn needs to be blown by somebody. So... <laughs> Is that okay with you, Greg? Still, I'll do a quick intro of how this team came together and. Yes, please. I'd rather you blow my horn than me blow my nose on, on your. Okay, so go and ahead. all of you people note that this is being said with great respect and no, no weird interpretations. <laughs> <laughs> so just a couple of uh, news items. Some of you may have seen um, Will Chapman um, and Boris, it's a pleasure to see you. I just sent your email out. Um, Will Chapman's post on the Piper Comanche Facebook group, and there should be something coming out on Delphi Airworthy, inviting people who are instructors who either have Comanches, have had Comanches, or have just a lot of instructional experience in Comanches to add their name to that instructor list. And once Greg starts talking and I stop talking, I'll put Will's email address into the chat window. Um, this is going to be a critical list. We um, brought it forward when we started to note that we had uh, a real need for people to be able to find experienced instructors to do transition training, along with both uh, Bruce Landsberg, who had, was the head of the uh, Air Safety Institute, noting that having people and experienced Comanche instructors seemed to be a critical safety <laughs> uh, element for Comanches. And then uh, also just for ongoing uh, expertise. So um, you'll see in the chat a little bit later, please, if you've got, if you're a CFI, CFII, and you're here, you're probably one of the people we're looking for. And I'll put his, uh, his stuff in there. Just say what uh, Comanche you owned or owned, own or owned, 
any notes you might want on avionics you're particularly familiar with, and then just a, a little bit about your uh, instructor ratings and what you like to do. Um, second, the parts teams are coming together and the, one of the critical things we're going to need to do to keep ourselves flying is make sure we have parts and make sure we have affordable parts that are good quality. And uh, Pat Lee is, is helping to coordinate that uh, from Minnesota. And um, there are a lot of really, really cool people starting to come together. That'll be its own Comanche Zoom. And then uh, just a quick general update on autopilots. Uh, good news is that we have two now approved and um, one imminent, which is the TRIO Pro Pilot, which is the main focus of our conversation tonight. Uh, as you all have heard, the STEC 3100 for the singles, all of them, and the uh, Garmin GFC 500 for um, all of the singles, except for the turbos and the 400s is now approved. And apparently there's a field approval in process for the 400s and for possibly the turbo uh, singles. Uh, the ProPilot is imminent. And uh, the other brand new news is other than that, everything is now starting to ship. Although the Garmin we're hearing is just earlier today um, in the hangar flying section, um, the, uh, <laughs> we got the report that the Garmin GFC 500 is shipping in pieces, but it is shipping. Uh, and the Garmin project for the twins is a go. The twin has been selected and uh, they are initiating their certification process for the GFC 500 for the twins. Important because the 600 was uh, normally what they were doing for twins and the 500 is, um, is a cheaper autopilot. Although I have been given the caveat that installed, there are going to be similar price points. Um, the really exciting thing was that to some extent, Garmin seems to have been kicked by the Trio Pro Pilots popularity and uh, an enormous buzz in the Comanche community. So does anybody have any question about the overall autopilots projects? That's the overall status of everything with some new news there. Craig Hammonds asked, how is the chip shortage um, affecting shipping of avionics? And the answer is, it's a great question. I don't know exactly. Mark Sullivan may want to jump in on that. And he has come into the chat, uh, into the Zoom and gone out a couple of times. What I can say for sure is we've seen delays on shipping um, JPIs and EDMs. And uh, I don't know whether that's related to the chip shortages or not. Does anybody else have any news? Yeah, I do. Hold on for a second. Hold on for one second now. Okay. Eric, I'll call you back. CJ, Wayne Somebody call him, Rick, he you? hasn't had any problems yet. Wayne said no problems with the chips? Not yet. Okay, was that Kevin? Okay, was that just, Kevin? Just, yeah, availability is your biggest thing. So. They got they got chips, but just no units. They're trying to no units. They're trying to you know make as many units as they can. Right now. <laughs> cool. And then um, one thing on autopilots then, uh, in general uh, that I think everybody will find interesting. I was speaking with um, Assured Partners, which is the AOPA's um, insurance agent. And Assured Partners said that several of their underwriters will give a discount if the following combination of safety equipment is present in an airplane. And I had never heard this. I'm curious to, if you if you know if you knew this, please post in the chat window because I had no idea. The three things, and they all have to be present, is an autopilot with altitude hold, an IFR GPS, and three is a moving map. And so if you have, um, you know, like. An IFD 440, you've got, you've satisfied the moving map and the, uh, and the IFR GPS. And then if you have any, the TRIO Pro Pilot satisfies the autopilot with altitude hold as to the uh, other two that, that are coming or either, either are here for the singles or coming. And uh, Mark? I can, by the way, I want to address the chip thing. I'm sorry, I had a call yeah. there right at the same time. The, uh, yeah, we were very scared back in January because the chip thing would look really critical. And Trio was able to find literally a pallet of the chips that we use in the UK. So we're good for 
a couple of years. We're, we're fine. But I would be, we use a, uh, um, it's essentially a pretty low performance chip by design <clears throat> because the, uh, and that's by design. So we don't need a lot of power. So I don't know about other, if people are using, you know, 32 bit, 64 bit chips, that probably is going to be a problem. But we're not. We're using like an eight bit chip works on it. Um, in any event, we don't have a problem. We thought we had a problem. We no longer have a problem. Good news. Thanks, Mark. Um, but if there's a lot of, I tell you, it's not just avionics though. At Sun and Fun, I was talking to, you know, there's an awful lot of stuff out there now that has a chip in it. And, you know, one of the vendors, I think Electroware, they said they scrambled, they were able to find some. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of stuff that we take for granted that has a chip in it that could have unexpected shortages, particularly if it's a high performance chip. I'd be real curious to know with the, uh, like with Avidyne and Garmin, if, you know, if they have an assured source, I don't know if they do or not. This is uh, Rob, I have a quick question. It's not about chips, but you were referring to the, 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 dis the insurance discount with the yes. certain equipment and you got a moving map display. Does a display on something like a, a GTN 750 or something like that count or does it have to be like a separate big old thing in the middle? Nope. Of the they said that the something like a GTN 750 did count. That's a combined moving map display and IFR GPS. And, and what was the source of this again? I was kind of half listening. Sure, yep. This is a senior agent with Assured Partners, which is the, uh, it used to be the integral part of AOPA that was their aviation insurance. They separated it because of the inherent conflict of interest, but Assured Partners is a huge uh, insurance agency that acts as a front for many, many insurance underwriters. Mm -hmm. And they said uh, several of their underwriters that write policies for Comanches will give a discount if you have an autopilot with altitude hold plus an IFR GPS and moving map capability. No age limit on the autopilot, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is another unfortunate thing. Um, the only insurance underwriter that we're aware of that has no age limit for insuring pilots is Avemco. And if oh, you I'm are at... in with Avemco <laughs> by age so I'm 80, at the autopilot. Uh, yep. Nope. No age limit on the autopilot. If you have oh, an no. autopilot with altitude hold, they said all of them qualify. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Unfortunately, not all underwriters give that discount, um, and I, uh, but we will see. Okay, so on to, um, you know, two years ago, we had been waiting for ages for autopilots for Comanches, and there were so, there were basically no choices, and they were all over $25,000 installed, and two years ago, Many of us can and did buy Comanches for $25,000. And so the cost to add an autopilot was the same as the price for a low price Comanche. Not a good equation, not great for safety, not great for the aircraft. And uh, many in the community came together to both try to get the word out about these amazing airplanes and our uh, values have been going up. Try to go, go try to buy um, a good airworthy 250 right now for under 60,000, I dare you. And um, it's, it may still be possible, but it's getting to be hard to do. And the twin prices are going up at last. And uh, so we're really happy about that because our airplanes being valuable helps keep them out of the boneyard in case of a minor accident. And we'll catch up with fi fixing our hull values, but as they get more valuable, it's less likely that they're going to be parted out or otherwise destroyed for a minor problem. In the meanwhile, the other thing that happened is that we started to really advocate as a group and the, um, the vendor started to notice us and now we have autopilots. So that's really exciting. But one of the most special projects was the TRIO Pro Pilot project. And that one was, I think we all felt really important because many Comanche drivers uh, fly or update on, upgrade on a budget. And uh, the Pro Pilot came over from the experimental world, high quality, fantastic track record, um, but being done by a small company, and we were kind of an oddball airplane in that the pro pilot um, was, uh, and I forgive me for, for telling your story, Greg and Mark, but I just wanted to introduce the team and explain why it was so important that the team came together. The pro pilot 
had been certified for the, um, the, particularly for the Cessna 100 series, very successfully. And the Cessnas all loved the, the ProPilot and had been uh, purchased and used by over 3,000 experimentals out in the field. And as Mark Sullivan has said previously, with not a single incident, it's part of why the FAA was so eager to bring it and the true track over to the certificated area. But the Comanche both flies faster and has a longer throw required for the pitch servo than most of the, uh, than any of the other aircraft flying for the pro pilot. And so I wanna just introduce and name the team that came together to work with the STC group and particularly thanks to Mark Sullivan for being our advocate. Um, because if, if any of these people hadn't come together, this project wouldn't have happened. And it was amazing because this, all of these special talents in the Comanche community made their special talents available um, upfront, not charging anybody anything, um, willing to, to delay that just to make the project happen, just to make us all safer and more valuable and more capable. So in the, I just wanna recognize there's a, a pilot that many of you don't know. He is now 80, he is a twin driver Drive, he flies his twin Comanche off of the road in front of his farm in Wisconsin or Minnesota, George Alston. George Alston couldn't be here tonight because he actually has just finished getting his medical approval again and he was traveling back from Mayo Clinic. So he said hello to everybody. Uh, George is a former DER. He has over 100 STCs, including an STC for the Chelton autopilot and the twin Comanche, which was acquired by Aztec. And George uh, looked at the trio servos, did the math, and sent some sketches over to Mark Sullivan saying, you're going to need a capstan uh, for, the, for the Comanches because of the long throw and the higher control forces. And, um, and then uh, the person who's going to be talking this evening, Greg Teal, is critical. And I want to also just note that Russ Wright, who is the, um, the lead moderator of the Piper Comanche Facebook group, was the person that said, you know, you're going to need Greg Peel. So Greg Peel, I want to introduce, Greg is a mechanical engineer for many, many years, uh, loves the Comanche and had one and now is, is restoring his second amazing Comanche fully, like went up, bought the airplane with his best friend, disassembled it, put it on a trailer, hauled it back down to his place all the way across the country, back down to his uh, hangar in Florida. And someday you all will see it. And I promise that it's one of the most amazing models uh, in, in the fleet when it's flying, when, when it finally flies. The, uh, but Greg's particular capabilities included the fact that he had actually worked with the STC group closely and been uh, heavily responsible for the approval of the STC of the pro pilot in the Cherokee, the PA-28. And so those, they worked together and that project went through quickly. The, um, the other thing that Greg brings is in addition to being a mechanical engineer and having a shop that can make things like brackets <laughs> for the pro pilot and cab stands, um, from blueprints is he has uh, the capability to do drawings and the drawings are one of the things that hold up many projects. And so uh, it was Greg's capability of doing drawings that made this project able to go forward. Then of course, no surprise, we have Zach Grant. Zach Grant's special capability is having some weird map in his head that gives you the internal, uh, the internals of every single model of Comanche um, including electric flat models, Johnson bar flat models. And Greg will talk a little bit about why that was so important. But Zach helped the team find a universal install that's the same for every single Comanche. And that's part of why the install time period is so short for the Trio Pro Pilot. Then there's Matthew Smith. Many of you who've gone to docs.northeastcomanche.org and noted that you can now get all of the service manuals, parts catalogs, every single AD, service letters, service bulletins, and really cool old sales brochures from Piper, all at docs.northeastcomanche.org, where the mirror site for the, the work Matt's been doing. So when the team was trying to figure out what they were gonna do with this project, we went, hey Matt, can you send pictures of all of the interiors of the fuselages of the singles and the twins? And hey, like within half an hour, we get this cascade of, uh, of the of screenshots of 
the interiors of all these airplanes that could be used to make the project go forward faster and cheaper. Um, and then there were the airplanes themselves, Sean Cash. So all of the autopilot projects got held up for need of an airworthy Comanche that was in rig and in annual. That, that they, the uh, Aztec project actually got held up for three months. The Garmin had to switch their uh, certification bird. And, uh, and so I wanna just acknowledge Sean Cash who uh, allowed his Comanche 180 and Marty Hench who allowed his really Cherry 250 and then Mark Sullivan with his turbo twin Comanche. Um, those airplanes were made available. Uh, you know, just here they are, please make this project happen. Um, have I, uh, and then most critical in a funny way, Hans Newbert, the DER who has given so much to the fleet and Hans simply said uh, in his very dignified and as his son said, your favorite Comanche driving Vulcan way, um, just go bring this together. He was the one that said, bring it together, bring the expertise together. Something like this is something that a DER can approve. And with that coaching and that team, uh, Mark Sullivan, and then of course, the STC group's core team of, uh, of um, AJ and um, I'm having a very senior Jeff moment Odom. here. Thank you, Jeff Odom. Jeff Odom. Oh my gosh, Jeff, thank you. Um, <laughs> who, is, who is the general manager of the whole thing? The project moved forward. So I, uh, I just, um, now you don't have to toot your own horn, Greg, and I'm going to turn this over to you. But I wanted to just tell a little bit like that combination of former DAR, DER, a mechanical engineer, um, you know, ANPIA slash, you know, super expert. Uh, you know, and then Matt's sort of software genius. It, it just, everybody just generously made it happen. And that coalition of, of people from the Comanche community made it, made it go. I would suggest that everybody on the Zoom now go to the little thing up there in the corner and uh, go to the speaker view. That way, when the, the share goes on, you'll be able to see who's talking nicely. So, yep. And so Greg Peel and Mark Sullivan, um, I just want to hand this over to you and say thank you so much for everything you've done for all of us. And okay. Greg, thank please you. talk about it. And then Mark will be talking about what's, what's uh, legal versus possible. Okay, thanks a lot, CJ. Can you hear me now? Yep. Can you hear me? All right, can you hear me, guys? Yep. Loud, yes, we loud, can hear you. Hear you. Okay. And Pete, okay, thanks, are you Pete. ready All to right. screen share Greg's Prezo? I'm not uh, quite do you ready want me to me. do it? Not yet. I want to give a little intro also before we, we before we do the uh, um, screenshots. Okay. Um, okay. Let me let me just add on a little bit, or um, maybe I don't have to. CJ pretty much said everything. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about my experience. I want to talk a, a little bit about, a lot about the TRIO development. And then lastly, I want to talk about flying behind the TRIO because I think that's where a lot of people um, will have questions and Mark's going to chime in also about um, what it can do and what can it legally do. There's a lot of talk about that on many forums. Um, I, as CJ said, I'm a mechanical engineer. I worked uh, uh, for 18 years on, on military avionics, solely communication equipment. I worked for Raytheon and about 22, 23 years ago, I started my own business and some of you know of it from the form. It's Impact Precision Products in Clearwater, Florida. And um, I do industrial stuff mostly, but I ended up, you know, I, I've got so many people that want airplane related stuff that you end up spending half your time doing that. So uh, my, my experience comes from the military world and the, uh, the ex expertise required. And, you know, I always work to military specifications. And they're really not a whole lot different than the specifications that we work to um, in the general aviation field. Um, 
about four years ago, as CJ said, I got involved um, with the STC group through TRIO. I attended Sun and Fun the year before that. And I said, all right, I want to put an autopilot in my Cherokee, my warrior at the time. So I approached True Track and I approached TRIO. And I liked the TRIO. I liked the presentation. I liked uh, the people there, um, Chuck. And um, so I, I, I brought it up to their attention. They said, don't even talk to us about it. <laughs> We're an experimental, experimental autopilot. Don't talk to us about it. We don't want to know. <laughs> However, if you do want to get involved, contact these people at the STC group because they're working on the Cessnas right now. So I did that and I worked with um, uh, Mark back in uh, 2017, I believe it was, and successfully put the trio in my Cherokee. And I'll talk later about flying behind that. Um, it's awesome. So um, a few years later, um, I'm on to my second Comanche. And this was um, three years ago. I, as CJ said, I purchased this uh, low time PA24. It's a 250, has 2,350 hours on it and hasn't flown in 34 years now. And I found it through my, my ANP. Um, he was up in Massachusetts. He, my, my A&P was the mechanic for Skydive City in Zephyr Hills. He worked on uh, many different variety of planes, mostly at that time, the Twin Otters, but uh, his boss happened to live up in Northwestern Massachusetts. And he was up at his airfield there, Turner's Falls. He calls me up one day, he says, hey, Greg, I got a project for you. Uh-oh, what is it? And he tells me, I said, well, send me pictures. And I asked him, I said, well, do you really think this is worth, you know, overhauling, restoring. He goes, I wouldn't send you pictures otherwise. So I contacted the, the owner. Um, it was uh, the father and son who owned the FBO. And uh, they're well known up, they were well known up in that area as one of the premier mechanic shops up in that area. But the son, Bruce said, uh, well, it's dad's plane. He's still gonna restore it someday. But as many other restoration stories go, dad's on his deathbed and we can't sell it until, um, He's no longer with us. So I get a call uh, late in the fall, I think it was that year, and uh, says, well, dad's, dad, dad passed away and uh, we, can, we can complete this transaction. And, and Bruce, the son, was very enthusiastic about me restoring it because that's what dad always wanted to do. So I said, well, I'm not coming up there in the winter. I'll come in the fall or I'll come in the spring. So, okay. So uh, I worked it out with my, uh, my best friend who's a, a Bonanza pilot. Um, we went to Sun and Fun and we left the day after Sun and Fun with a truck and a trailer and all the tools that we thought we'd need. We went up there on a Monday morning, early Monday morning after Sun and Fun, and we came back by Saturday morning, daybreak, back to Florida. So we covered uh, uh, probably 2,500 miles and disassembled, packed up an airplane and pulled into my driveway uh, Saturday morning, um, right after daybreak with an airplane on the back of my truck. And I'm sure my neighbors said, what's this guy doing now? <laughs> and so it wasn't there long. I brought it out to my shop, which is only about five or six miles away. And I overhauled the entire airplane there. In other words, stripping it down, taking the engine out, taking the panel out, taking it down to every pulley and cable and every nut and bolt on the airplane and restored it there. And then brought all the parts up to my hangar, which is 50 miles away. And it's been just over a year. And I'm, I am right now one month away from, from uh, doing the annual. We're gonna do it the weekend after 4th of July. It's scheduled now. I'll get enough time in on the airplane to um, bring her to Oshkosh. And this will be the first time, the first times the plane will be flown in 34 years. So I'm really looking forward to that. Unfortunately, there was only two owners before this airplane. And unfortunately, none of them are alive anymore uh, to show them what I've done to her. But um, I'll carry it on. I planned on this being my very last airplane. Uh, so I have, I have spared no expense or desire in what I want in the airplane. Uh, and when it's, when I'm gone, it'll be my son's, my son's a pilot. Also, I don't think he'll ever fly again. He saw some, uh, some of his friends from Florida Institute of Technology got killed in airplanes, um, in an airplane accident, but he can do what he wants with it. So anyway, when I, when I 
designed the panel for this airplane. Trio was not uh, part of in the running because they were not working on the on the uh, Comanche project. However, at that time, Andrew Barker from True Track had it. Um, was working on the, the certification or was going to work on the certification for the Comanche line. And then all of a sudden he sold it to Bendix King and that project went away. I said, okay, well, that changes my mind. Let's approach STC group and trio again and let's work on the, on the trio because this is what I really wanted in the airplane anyway. It's a joy to fly, it's fe feature full um, for what I need and, and what uh, probably 90% or more of pilots need. And Mark will talk more about that. Um, so um, that being said, I, I changed my mind. I had the harness, the, the, uh, the harness, uh, main harness for the panel made up to include um, connections up to an autopilot. True track and, and uh, Trio use the same connections. You use RS-232 data for, uh, and, and airing 429 for your vertical and horizontal guides or vice versa. So that being said, Pete, go ahead and put up the first uh, PowerPoint slide and I'll talk a little about um, the development of the trio for the Comanche. Can I, can I ask a question about that Comanche? Because I was, I was at Turner's Falls, so I was still based there and, and uh, that was a brown and white one, is that correct? At the time it was, yes, it was Charlie's it, plane. It was Charlie's, right. And he painted the, he painted the wheels white with about the worst <laughs> spray paint <laughs> I could ever imagine. And, they the spray painted everything. <laughs> so here's my question. They yeah. started the engine pretty regularly on that Comanche, but they, you said, as you're right, you hadn't flown for 34 years, but they did start. So my question was really two, how was the engine? And the, there was some question about whether the zinc chromate uh, protected against corrosion enough to restore that plane. And I was always curious about those two things. What was the engine like? Okay. And was there any cor corrosion? G great questions. And I, I'm just going to touch on them briefly. I don't want to get off subject too much. But sure, the engine, sure. I had no, I know that there was some new parts on it. So I know it had been, it had been run. Uh, I also know another fellow up there. I met him while we were disassembling, Jim Manti. So you know him and his command ship there, right? Very well. Jim's you know, one Jim of my best friends. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, the engine, there was no question in my mind that the engine was going to come out and to be taken apart and put a new engine in it. So, but when I took it apart uh, and back up a little bit, like I said, there were some new parts on it. There was a new carburetor. There was a new fuel pump. Um, there was various new things that I could tell that it was, it, it was maintained enough to run it. Prop was long gone because of the AD. Right. I mean, it was 30 years out of, at the time it was 31 years hadn't flown. I've had it for three years. So when I tore the engine down, I did it personally. Um, the pistons looked very good. Uh, the very little scuffing on the pistons. The cylinders um, appeared, now I was replacing all six cylinders, but the cylinders appeared to have cracks in the exhaust port on all six cylinders. Wow. From what I understand, that engine, well, the engine was original to the plane, so it only had 2,350 total hours, but there was 500 hours, from what I understand, on that overhaul. So it was fairly new. But everything else looked good. The crank was at standard dimensions, didn't need, uh, didn't need grinding, just polishing. Um, the, everything else actually looked very good. Now, as far as the zinc chromate, I stripped, I stripped the plane down to bare aluminum, but all the zinc chromate was intact and there was not one spot of corrosion anywhere on that airplane. That's amazing because it was always outside. It was always outside. Well, you know, Except I for the very that. end when Charlie had it added inside a few for a yes. few months. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when I when I went up there, um, it was sitting outside with flat tires and had ice on it. Right. So right. I, I didn't. We equip, couldn't believe. I didn't we couldn't believe it, it when it was gone. And it, it was it was kind of miserable for me. Uh, I didn't even have the right clothes for it. So we put it in the hangar and it was pretty cold, but we did it. So. Uh, so anyway. OK, so back to the um, the development program. Um, as you see in the picture there, we've got two different instrument heads. The one on the right is the round head, the three and an eighth inch head, which is really, I think, preferred by most pilots. Number one, because you can 
put it in any round hole that you've got. Now there are requirements of where it needs to be um, within pilot sight and reach. You wouldn't want to put it on the far right side. You couldn't use it. I like putting it in the top left corner. That's where it was in my Cher Cherokee and that's where it's known in the Comanche. And then the um, panel mount, which is exactly, has the same features. You can put it under a radio. You can put it in the center stack. On a Comanche, you can put it in the left, left stack if it's still there. They have the same features. The only, there's only one difference. There's an on-off switch that's required for the panel mount, whereas the on-off switch is integrated in the top center on the round, round head. If you also look at the round head, you see from the experimental world that there's a, there's a ball there. And if you put those in an RV or something like that, you can actually use that in an experimental plane as your ball. Um, you don't, it's, it's not certified for use in a, in a certified airplane, but it's there. In other words, they didn't have to change the display or the actual original, the original instrument head, the round instrument head to go into the certified world. Since then they have changed it and they eliminated some stuff that wasn't necessary for the, for the certified world. And they've made the round head uh, about six or seven inches down to about three or four inches long. So it's easy to mount. And if you look at the top left, uh, that beautiful Comanche, um, when I, uh, when I was looking for a paint scheme for my Comanche, I searched thousands of pictures that I could find. And I saw this, I go, that's pretty sharp. I don't want red, white, and blue. So mine's metallic, burgundy, gray, and white but I have tip tanks also. So that was, that's why I put that beautiful picture and I thought it was pretty cool. And I think that's Miggs Field down below it in Chicago. Uh, go to the next one, Pete. Okay, uh, being an engineer, <laughs> you got to think like one. So this is, this is actually, this was actually in my airplane, in my fuselage, um, back in about October or so. And CJ is sitting outside the, the, uh, the airframe talking to me. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for parts and stuff like that. I started with a cardboard template. I did that. I do that with a lot of things. If you want to try to fit something, there's no sense in having to bend up aluminum and cutting it and taking the time to do it. Just get your pen and a piece of cardboard and, and draw out something that fits and then turn it into um, an actual piece. So uh, what we did, CJ and I did, we took Sean Cash's 180 and we flew it down to um, Albert Witten in St. Pete, Florida, getting it ready to bring out to Oxnard, California. And while she, while she was here, we worked on the design. So that's how new it was at the time. Um, and from there, I actually still have that piece of cardboard. Now it's about one third the size. I just brought a piece of cardboard from a box. You can see it was a, a divider. I think it was from, probably from like a case of wine or something. <laughs> I don't know. Pete, go to the next one. Okay, so there's what it turned out. That was the first, that was the initial release of the, of the pitch servo bracket. Um, it, we did have some revisions after that. We lowered it a little bit. And the cable that is running um, fore and aft in the airplane, it's running on the center line of the fuselage above that stringer is the control cable, one of the control cables for the stabilator. And that, that mounting platform uh, is secured on the right-hand side uh, so with some PEM nuts that are put into the, into the stringer and some screws mounted into it and then mount um, secured to the center stringer with some more screws. And then you'll see four mounting holes. Um, those were PEM nuts, but we ended up eventually uh, using nut plates underneath, uh, floating nut plates. And that's where the servo mounts for the, um, for the pitch servo. And go to the next one, Pete. Okay, so CJ was talking about the fact that we needed a longer travel because we have a more than an eight inch throw 
on the pitch servo cable. The original Trio servo has a, has a lever arm and that lever arm has stops on it. So it's got about a, I don't know, about a hundred and I'm say 110, 120 degree travel. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it wasn't adequate because we could only get a short throw through three inches or so. I believe the lever arm center to center between the axle and the, and the throw was maybe two and a half inches, 2.7 inches, something like that. And there was a few different revisions of that for different aircraft for Cessna, Piper. Um, um, and that, but that still wasn't enough. So the, uh, the drawing there, that's not my drawing, that was done through um, Chuck, through one of his people uh, at TRIO. Um, that mounts to the side of the servo, the stops, the mechanical hard stops come out of the, out of the, the uh, servo. And this capstan, which a wire cable runs around with a cage around it to hold it captive. And it has a continuous motion. In other words, the stops, there's no stops. So it just, can, it just has an unlimited travel. We needed more than eight inches and this does it. So um, the, the benefit here also is since that lever arm was approximately 2.7 inches, this um, capstan from the center to the outside is, uh, I think about 1.3 inches. So we've, we've changed our lever arm. And for those that can understand this, and it's pretty, pretty easy to understand, the lever arm changed by, by, by 50%. In other words, now we have 100% more torque available in that same servo. And that servo can be used to, to, tra to, to, to um, move, a, move a cable an infinite amount, what we needed. And then you can see the, the cage that goes around. This is an exploded view. There's a cage that goes around that capstan. And once the wire is, is uh, wound around the capstan, and that, that is actually a spiral. It's not individual grooves. That is a screw spiral. It's an inclined plane. So they move together, forward and backward. And that cage goes around it and the cable cannot jump out of the groove, which is very important. You don't want it binding up on you because that's a, you're not going into a death spiral. It, you can't, it can't let it happen. And that is the, uh, that's the prevention there. Uh, go to the next one. Okay, this, um, that last picture was actually one, I got the drawing, there's more drawings than that for the actual dimensions. And that's one sitting on my desk at my shop. And then this is installed on the, on the servo. You can see the same parts now without the cage. You can see the screw holes for the cage, but there's no cage, there's no wire on it right now. That was just the first, okay, let's put it together. Let's see how it fits. Go to the next one. Okay, this is, this is how you turn your idea into a design. There is the, there is the bracket. This is actually a picture taken uh, out in California and that blanket sitting on Marty Hench's wing. Yeah, and, baby. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, baby, I recognize that blanket. <laughs> hey, Marty. <laughs> Okay, so I had to get some pictures that says we we're going along. So there's, there is the first generation, the first revision of the bracket. Uh, no anodizing yet, we don't need it. We're just trying to make this work. And there's the, the cable, bridal cable wrapped around the cap stand. And you can see there is a, uh, a tie wrap, a zip tie holding it in place with, with the cage around it. Okay, go to the next one. And, and by the way, uh, this I presented this to a handful of people at Sun and Fun. I put this uh, PowerPoint presentation together. Um, so some of you have may seen this, but um, that we have a much bigger audience here. So I'm really glad that uh, that we have a you know a larger audience and people are getting updated on how it was put together and where we're at and um, how it's going to fly. Okay, so we mounted it in the airframe. All right, this first revision, the first generation bracket, uh, I didn't have a servo when I, when I made this bracket. 
Um, so I didn't, I didn't have the, bent, the dimensions and that capstan was mounted much too high. It needed to be right adjacent to that cable that's running next to, to the left of the bracket. That's the stabilator cable again. So out of the shop out there, we cut it down. We made it much, much lower. And all we had to do was turn that one, we, we had to make that leg shorter and remount it. Um, I think that we probably have a picture of that. Let's go on and see. I'm not sure if we do, but you visualize that's much lower and that, and that cap stand is running right next to the cable. No, we don't. Okay, go ahead. All right, so we need to get 7654 pop out to Oxnard. So CJ and I took it from St. Pete and we had a delightful trip out to California. We stopped in Texas for about three days and visited my buddy with his Bonanza. We stopped in Sedona because of, uh, I don't know, what were they maybe 40 or 50 or 60 knot headwinds said, we're not getting any further than this. Um, so we put it down in Sedona and, and, uh, and from there we went on. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> we weren't quite standing still like we would have been in a Cherokee, but it was much too close. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We were going forward still, yeah. Okay, en route, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we found this crater and this is somebody that wasn't using a Trio Pro Pilot and this is what he did. Now, this was really cool. This is the, uh, the meteor crater that Mark Sullivan said, don't miss it. I'd never seen it before, even though I'd been through there and I didn't know about it. So we, uh, we flew past it. That was kind of a treat. Go to the next one. Okay, so we're now in Oxnard and this is Marty's uh, airplane. He's local to that airport within a short flight. And we moved his airplane in there and we started working and we worked a lot of hours till late at night. We had, we had nothing else to do, um, installing it. And Marty uh, brought lots of tools, lots of parts, lots of fasteners. I mean, everything that we needed in addition to what the STC group had, this is the STC group's hangar. Um, and, and we started working on it and we worked on it for, I don't know. I don't know how many days we were out there, but most of a week. Go to the next one. And by the way, this is all back in early, no, early November. Yeah, I think the first week of November. Okay, so I, I talked about the pitch servo and I, I had a, um, a roll servo design. This is the main spar underneath the rear seat. And in Marty's plane, this is where the Century 2 roll servo was mounted. Go, well, lo and behold, I'd never seen this before. Lo and behold, that's where my servo was being mounted. And you can see the cross cable there going through a, a hole uh, in the forward part of the spar. Um, and that is the aileron, one of the aileron control cables. So we removed that and we mounted the bracket that I brought with me. And at that time we found out, and this was, this was through a lot of research that yeah, we can mount it there. And we didn't see any interference, but we wanted a universal installation for every model from a 180, 250, 260, 400 and a twin. And then we found out, and this was through Zach Grant, I believe, um, that, oh wait, in the later ones, in, in, well, in any mo models that have electric, uh, flap, or electric um, flaps, the flap motor is mounted there and it would interfere. We didn't have the room to mount it there. So uh, AJ and Jeff at the STC group came up with a new design to mount it underneath the left foot well. There's an easily removable panel there after you pull the carpet back, which is very easy to do. And um, about a dozen screws and you've got access. Uh, okay, here, yeah, here it was originally, the roll servo originally installed. And you can see that the uh, servo, if you, if you can zoom into that is, the servo cap stand is mounted right next to the uh, control cable. So that was, a, that was a really good location. It was very easy to get to. Um, Time-wise, this was a, a, a very simple installation, but it didn't work for all models. So the STC group came up with a different design. And I don't think that I even, I don't think there's pictures of that on here, but the design, it, it uses 
Um, well, okay, there, there's a picture of my plane actually, but without the brackets. Um, mounts right there, so it's easy to get to once the two front seats are out and that panel's out. And it attaches to one of those cables right there, the far, um, yeah, one of the, it mounts right in that area. And it uses some of the existing holes. And I think on the backside, you just have to drill a couple holes for installation. And it really is a, a, a universal, easy installation with uh, one, two, uh, three, four pieces of bent aluminum, anodized aluminum, and the servo mounts hangs down. It actually hangs down. There's plenty of room for it. And you attach the bridle cable from the capstan onto the aileron cable there, which is, which is um, uh, Pete, can you move your cursor um, point next to it? Keep going to the right. Keep going to the right. Keep going right there. Nope, right, go back, back one. Go back one, go to the left, right there. I believe that's the cable that attaches to. Um, the other cables are, are obviously other control surface cable cables, um, but it hooks to one cable, forward aft movement. Now, now the roll servo cable travel is very short. It's two and a half, two and three quarter inches. So it doesn't have to move very far. The lever arm could have worked there, but actually this is better for two reasons, um, for three reasons, actually. I don't like the, the lever arm. If it ever went over center, you cannot get it back. Now the design is, you design it so it can't go over center, uh, but the capstan, you doubled the torque. Not that we really need it too much, especially for aileron um, travel, aileron forces. So the, the servos are actually calibrated with a, with a clutch where they release after a certain torque. The first time we put them in there, we had them set to the original torque and it ripped the, it ripped the bridle right off the uh, control cable because it was pulling so hard. So we turned down the torque and everything worked fine. And that's another benefit of, uh, of the uh, trio servos is that literally while you're flying with the servos engaged, if you had to make an abrupt maneuver, uh, about three pounds of force on your yoke, you can override the clutch, uh, the servo, because it has a clutch and you can just fly it normally and you let go and it's right back to normal. But you also have an autopilot disconnect button on your yoke. But if you had to very quickly um, divert for, for whatever reason, a bird, another airplane, whatever, you can grab the yoke and very, very easily override the, the because of the clutch. Are the servos brushless? Okay. Are the Say servos again. brushless? The servos are, they are brush brushless. I'm sorry? Say again? Are they brushless servos? Yes, they are. Thank you. Yes, they are. There's a difference between this and the true track. The true track uses stepper motors and they're very loud. You actually hear them in the plane and they don't move smoothly like the, like the, the uh, gold standard trio servo does. Very, very smooth, very strong, very lightweight. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, here, here's the view I was looking at. This is, this is one of my drawings and this is the PA24 roll top assembly drawing that shows the installation to, on the left side, that's the footwell. And there are, there are four brackets, one on, one on the, um, two running fore and aft, which are almost the same. They are different because the, the servo is mounted at a slight angle because of the, uh, the capstan pitch. And then you've got a bracket fore and a bracket aft that hold those two. And then you see the servo hanging down and um, if you if you read all this, you'll you'll understand it. Coming out the back side of that drawing, you'll see the cable clamp, and that's where it's clamped on one plate. There it is, right there, clamped on one place to the aileron control cable, and then forward. Um, yeah, you can see it right there. Also, there's your two cable clamps with a short bridle rolled around the capstan. 
And to the right side of the drawing, there's the overhead view of the roll servo installation fuselage location. And um, like I say, it's easy to get to. Uh, very quick installation. The, the screw holes on the back side, on the aft side of the, of the um, servo mounting uses existing holes. And on the forward edge, you have to drill those three holes and that's it. That's it. So you match drill them to your bracket and uh, the brackets have uh, floating nut plates. And so you just go through the hole in, in the, uh, the, the holes that you drilled and attach them. And it's best to, uh, if you're working with the area ANP or if you install this yourself, it's best to build up that entire assembly and then install it as one unit. Don't, don't put it together piece by piece as you go like an, an erector set. Uh, Greg, I have a question for you, if you got a minute. Yeah. I was wondering about the torque uh, limitation setting. Go ahead. Is that is that a software change, or do you have to turn a little screw somewhere? It is actually, it's mechanically set, but those, that clutch is set at the factory for this installation. They're all unique to each airplane, and it's critical that you leave them there. Okay. And so if you look at the top right, if you look at the top right, um, the top left, it says roll servo clutch set to 39 inch pounds. It doesn't say inch, there was a revision needed on the drawing. 39 inch pounds plus or minus five pounds. Okay. The pitch servo is a little bit different, a little bit different torque setting, but it's also shown on the drawing. These drawings, um, I don't, well, yeah, these, yes, these are included. These would be included on the uh, with the kit because this shows the the installation. There's about you know two dozen drawings at least um, for the manufacture and installation of of the kits. What were you uh, What were you referring to then when you said that the that the servo um, pulled the bridle uh, assembly off or moved it off that one uh, cable <laughs> before we. Um, and you said you made an adjustment or something on it. Okay, yeah, we first powered up the uh, the roll servo when, when we put the instrument head on and it was, okay, let's power it up and let's move it stop to stop. Well, since we didn't have limits set, um, the, uh, the ailerons hit their stops, but the servo wanted to keep on going and it just, it just pulled the wire right out of the out of the uh, out of the uh, uh, cable clamp, or it stretched it anyway, and we go, wow, we didn't realize we had this much power available. So we 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 went in and mechanically changed the clutch setting at that point, and it was it's a it was a simple thing to do. You have to disassemble this. Did I just get cut off? Can you? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? I can hear okay. you. Okay. All right. That's a, as long as you can hear me. I just so, like so to, that I, uh, so so on the kit. Screen. If you get it for a specific airplane, is that all? Is that all preset now, or we? Just... Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. No, it's preset. That's not. That's not user. That's not a user defined setting. That is going to be preset. Okay. So a twin. You think the control forces on a twin or the throw on a twin will be significantly different? Than that I don't know maybe I don't believe so but we're yet to find that be, find out that Mark's got his twin out there and that's going to be the installation project um, I think that um, I think that Hans knows that information because he was involved he, he actually came out and, and joined us when we were doing the installation he did some measurements uh, um, but we they'll have to actually do flight tests We'll okay. find that out. We actually, actually, we, actually we actually did measure the the, uh, the amount of force required, and it's well within the capacity of the servo. The issue was yes. the travel, yes. which of course the capstan solves. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, Pete. I lost a total screen here. Is uh, is did everything go black? Still has a thing. I moved up to the, the picture of your the group. 
Okay, I have a black screen here. Let me, maybe it's, oh, let me see. Let me, let me get back into this. Maybe, uh, maybe I just lost it. Hang on. So, Mark, maybe you can take over the narration. I, where do we leave off here? I just got called away for a second. Um, yeah, Greg is. Oh, okay. black, Greg has a black screen. If if you can take over the what? narration, that would help. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the screenshot there, of course, the team at Oxnard, and when we got done with the install in Marty's airplane. Um, we did the test flight with it and the test flight that we've talked about this in an earlier <clears throat> zoom, the test flight was our best test flight to date. I mean, of, with all the Cessna 100 series, we've never had one perform as well as the Comanche did. I mean, it was on rails following the uh, magenta line, altitude hold was precise. All of that was excellent. Um, people, I know people are getting upset or concerned what, what's happened at the FAA. It's a good point for me to address what's going on there is we've discovered our friends at the FAA, as much as we love them, they're, they've been so overwhelmed during COVID um, and there's been such turmoil over the Boeing 737 MAX autopilot issue. Um, they've been hung up on software. So we've had sitting at, at the FAA, the Comanche project, which it should be a you know a clean shot. There should be no issue with it, and a Sakata project and a Cessna 150 152 project. And what's happened is the FAA has been fixating on software issues. We got our original STC under a uh, uh, a special policy memo, project specific policy memo, that allowed us to get to, to certify it without doing. It's called DO 178B, which is hey, a uh, back? software protocol. Oh, you're back. So oh, in any, okay. in any yeah, event, I guess I got lost there. Le, and so in any event, the FAA has gotten hung up on the software issue and was holding all of our projects because they couldn't decide whether or not we had adequately certified the software. And lo and behold, we discovered in several meetings over the last three weeks and some of the engineers that were holding didn't realize that we had a project specific policy memo that then was actually incorporated in a uh, um, you know, small airplane uh, directorate specific memo. It's, a, it's not even you know, project specific, it's a generic one on using uh, you know, functional verification for software. In any event, because this, this has become such an issue we finally uh, bit the bullet as of yesterday and have retained a software DER who's got a terrific relationship with the Chicago ACO. Um, I spoke with him actually this morning and you know he's gonna get the software stuff off the table because it, it should not be a holdup. And to be, for those that are not software guys, I mean, basically <clears throat> what we're doing is we're taking data just, you know, Bog standard RS-232 ERINC-429 data. We're doing nothing to the data. We're just taking the autopilots running off it. And if you've got an EFIS, we are just passing it through unaltered to the EFIS. And, you know, we've gone over that, in, you know, to, to our wits end with the various engineers. Um, the software DER, they only have one software engineer, by the way, at Chicago. And I've, I've reduced the problem to the following statement. Specifically, I think we were hearing from the Chicago engineers that we weren't using the wrong, we were not using the correct grade of aluminum in our software. <laughs> and they basically, these guys were not software engineers. So 
the DER has assured me that he's going to deal with the one software guy at Chicago and expects we can get that issue resolved. You know, we're hoping next week. Um, the good news is, is taking the software issue out of the way, our principal engineer <clears throat> has assured us that he's put the Comanche on the top of the stack. Uh, we told him, you know, we gotta get this thing approved in the very near term, because it's gonna take us about 30 days to get the PMA to, to build the parts. And we wanna be able to start delivering, you know, Oshkosh 2021. Um, we expect next week, week things are gonna be in the move on this. But, you know, we recognize we're a couple months behind and we apologize for that. Um, believe me, we've done everything we can to move this. We think we have it solved now, but it's been frustrating to the max. Greg, I'll let you take over again. Okay, I'm back. I don't, I don't know what happened, but I, I got, I got uh, cut off there at the, uh, I guess it was at the photograph. Uh, I think I mentioned everybody, the photographs up there and I, one person I didn't mention, the tall guy right in the middle, there's Marty. Hi, Marty. Um, okay, what, I, what, what I've done with this project was all on a voluntary basis. And that's why CJ said she's gonna toot my horn for me, but it was in, in compensation for, or for future compensation. And Mark and I agreed that, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a Trio Autopilot for my airplane and the, he's gonna provide it for me. So I'm gonna be one of the first ones also to have it installed. One of the really interesting things um, that you'll, that you'll, that is available to see, I think it's probably been on um, the Facebook Comanche page is the flight test, flight aware track of the original flight test. And this thing looked like it was on rails on a race course. It was just phenomenal. Mark said it was the best flight test they've ever had through the STC group for any of the airplanes that they, uh, that they modeled. So we're really anxious. You know, the, the Comanche is already a very stable airplane. And I think that contributed a lot to that too. So that was very, very um, encouraging to say to the least. Um, let me talk, let me stop right here and let me see if there's any questions about the development of it. Thanks about the development of the, um, the project. And after the, we have any questions, I wanna talk about flying with the TRIO and what it's been like. I flew, I flew behind it for about three years, so I know it intimately. And I flew a lot, a lot of, a lot of true cross countries. I mean, cross the country. So any questions? How does it stack up to an Aztec 50? I've never flown behind an S Tech 50, but I'll I'll tell you that I'll when I when I talk about flying behind it, I'll tell you my experience and the control I had with it. Uh, I don't know enough about the S I don't know enough about the S Tech 50 to to tell you that um, to give you any good answer for that. Sorry. I have a quick question for you. Did that airplane have any kind of an autopilot in it before the install? Or did you have to remove that? Yeah, on, on, on Marty's plane 7220, uh, Pop had, I, I showed the picture of that Century 2 roll servo that was installed. Um, so okay. maybe Marty can, can uh, speak about how, how that worked. Uh, oh, I, I don't know. We took that, we took it out. I just wondered if you had, there was, something original in there, or fairly original in there, that's all. I, I guess I didn't. The, yeah, that I, that, I think that um, that Century 2 was in there for the plane's life. <laughs> Not anymore though, Marty's, Marty's got a, a, a boat anchor or, um, or he already sold it. Parts. <laughs> no, I still have it, I still have that Century 2 and if anybody's interested in buying it. <laughs> there you go, there you go, yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's all, and he's got all the parts to it, all the, all the cables, everything else. Oh, let me talk about that a little bit. In, installation times, this is really important. I, I, got a, I got something on just before this meeting um, that somebody's maybe going to decide to install a Garmin because Garmin's saying 
30, you know, 40 hours to install. And somebody gave me the information that it was 80 hours to install a trio. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, it's not 80 hours to install a trio. It wasn't 80 hours to design the trio. Um, the, one, of the, one of the projects that has to be done is you have to run the wires. Trio provides a harness, a pre-assembled harness that plugs into each end, two servos and the instrument head. And then you have to obviously connect um, other wires such as power, ground, uh, air ink 429 and, and uh, RS-232 for your guidance to your, to your autopilot, which by the way, doesn't have to be a certified autopilot. I flew it in my Warrior with an iFly 740, didn't have, didn't have approach capability, but I didn't need it. But it did, vertic uh, it did vertical and horizontal um, uh, whole, uh, guidance perfectly. So one night after uh, 7654 pop, the 180 was down at St. Pete Clearwater Airport. I'm about 15 minutes away. I went down there one night with a little handheld flashlight. It was sitting outside on, on the ramp in front of the avionics shop, getting ready for an avionics upgrade. We're putting, a, among, amongst other things, uh, an IF, IFD 540 in, Navidine. And um, I said, well, I need, I'm going to run this harness. I already know where it goes, although I haven't installed one before. So with a handheld flashlight, I took out the right seat. I, the, the, fortunately, the carpet had sl slots for the uh, seat track, so I just lifted up the carpet. I took out the, uh, the right side footwell panel, similar to the left side where the servo goes on the right side. I took out the inspection plates that are after that. And I ran the harness up. There's a main channel that runs at the right footwell, runs up to behind the panel and there's a plastic guard that should be there. A um, couple screws take it out. So I ran the, the main harness up to the instrument panel where the control head would go. And then I ran the, uh, the rest of the wires, the servo wires back. Um, to the main spar area. And then the roll servo or the pitch servo harness after that where the, where the, uh, pitch, servo, or the pitch servo is mounted. I did this at night. I did it with a couple handheld tools. I thought I might have, you know, screwdrivers and I wasn't really prepared, but I thought I, need, I had what I needed with a flashlight and it probably took me an hour and a half to do that. So it's not hard. Now, now the, uh, the, the roll servo goes to the other side, of the other side of the panel and just drops down where the roll servo is mounted now. So that's even easier, but it's not hard to run this harness. I zip tied it back with the existing wires, avoiding, uh, well, there's really no power that runs through it. So it's not gonna affect your, any, um, coax cables for your radios. We're talking minimal power here. Uh, and actually it's only, it's only power going through it when, you, when the servos are in operation. And um, you know, I, since I know the system really well, I could install the, the, an entire system in, in a fresh airplane with, you know, hasn't been installed before. I could install it in probably 20 hours. And then there are some other options uh, now there really aren't options for the certified. Uh, I had connected up the fuel computer. There's actually there was actually a fuel computer in the experimental head, a full function fuel computer, and I hooked that up too, and that was a simple thing. But hooking it up to um, a non-certified GPS is a one wire connection to RS-232. That's all it took, and power, ground, and servo connections. So that was as simple as it could be. Now, if hey, somebody Greg. tells you it's going to take, if it's somebody tells you it's going to take more than forty hours, find another shop because this is a simple installation. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Greg, um, Marty again. Uh, the yeah. uh, one of the advantages to already having an autopilot installed in my airplane was I had a breaker, uh, a a, uh, a specific breaker for the autopilot. So I did. That's one thing I didn't have to do to, to you know to tap off the bus add a breaker and then run the power from there where you already had the power. So 
that, that again, that's not going to add much time to it, but that's just another another caveat. Yeah, yeah, good point, Marty. Uh, and I believe Mark can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe they include a breaker with the with the kit. Is that is that right? Uh, I you know it's a it's a fifteen dollar part. I think we did. Um, but then we had people that weren't using that were putting in different breakers. I think now we're shipping it without the breaker because it's a readily available okay a breaker because people because people want a different style yeah, breaker. Yeah, that, so we, people, True, people were true. And every, away and every airplane totally has a different wasted. style of breaker. That's a good point. Every right. airplane uses a different style to fit your bus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're right. It's a 15, $20 part. And uh, it doesn't have to be located um, where all the other breakers are. I mean, it can be located, you know, in a, in a um, accessible place because I know the Comanche breaker panel, if it's original, pretty hard to get at. Huh. Well, in fact, that's Frank, part could of the, I? Oh, good. dating back to the old school autopilots, the requirements, the uh, certification requirements, they all date back to the old school ones where a gorilla couldn't override the autopilot. And so they have, <laughs> you have to have like two or three ways of disconnecting it. And one of one was, yeah. one of them was the uh, um, circuit breaker, plus the on off switch, plus the autopilot interrupt switch. And the reason for all that quadruple redundancy is because with the old school autopilot, if it ran away, you know, you had to turn it off and because you, couldn't, you yes. couldn't override it. And as you pointed out, our, yes. it's really kind of academic because it's so easy to override. I did note somebody, by the way, asked Absolutely. how much it weighs. I should note the weight, but it's extremely light. I'm going to say the whole shooting match with all the harnesses, I'm going to, I should know the weight, but I'm guessing four to five pounds. Greg, did you ever weigh it? At the most, at the very most. At the yes. most. And the majority of that weight is the harness. Yeah. The servos are nothing. what? The servos are under a pound, well under a pound. They're under there. I think they're, they're in the, like 14 ounces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah. And the instrument and had somebody was asked, heavier, now it's half the size. Somebody asked about, you know, trim. Um, we believe uh, we have we 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 have not scientifically analyzed this, but we think we got such good performance with Marty's two hundred and fifty because with the capstan servo, you know, it, it's a digital servo, which means it's infinitely variable. But with all that you know excess torque and you know kind of infinite variability, um, I think the capstan servo is more is significantly more precise than the than the servo arm was. Um, Absolutely. Because it's- it, Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's holding it. I mean, with the servo arm, I have a Cessna 172 and it'll hold it. You know, we're talking plus or minus five feet. It's pretty damn good. But on the on the Comanche, the sucker was on rails. It was like a straight line on yeah. the altitude chart. It, let, let me talk about trim when I talk about flying behind it because I do have some comments yep. about that. I'd like to um, ask one. Yep. So for those of you who were at Comanche Town, um, there was something that we probably didn't emphasize, but I think it's given the question about install times, it's germane. Uh, the 180, the Comanche 180, Sean Cash's was flown back out across the country again from California to um, Florida. And at Comanche Town, there were presentations one day from Garmin on the GFC 500 project and from Trio ProPilot, including a, a, a version of what Greg is presenting now. And at the beginning, right before the beginning of the first presentation, uh, AJ Abdul Shafi from Trio, uh, from the, ST, from the uh, STC group, began to reinstall the ProPilot into the 180. So that was at about 8.45 a.m. Um, or nope, sorry, actually, that was at about 9.45 a.m. Greg completed his presentation at about noon, Greg, is that about right? I think they were different days, but I was asking earlier, how long did it take, AJ, to reinstall that? And I think uh, you were offline for the moment. 
Uh, yep, sorry about that. And that uh, total time to reinstall the autopilot was uh, uh, somewhere between two hours and 15 minutes and two hours and 30 minutes. Um, yeah, that yeah. was an airplane that was still half full of camping gear. And um, <laughs> so it, it included the time to remove the uh, the front seats and stow them under the airplane. Uh, but, you know, just to be clear uh, and, and to reinstall the servos in the head unit, to be clear, uh, the holes had already been drilled. And the harness, as Greg mentioned, which took an hour and 15 minutes to run when the airplane was open for other purposes, uh, had already been installed. And the tray for the head unit had already been installed. And the breaker was already there. Right. Um, but uh, so, so those were the, the things that had been done. It's a remarkably fast install. Um, I've been getting some questions and texts and I wanna go ahead and just answer those really quickly uh, or ask Mark and Greg to answer them. So the, okay. one of the text questions are, does this include the time for the removal of an old autopilot if, if it's already installed? Since, that, since that's not under the control of, of anybody else, but whoever owns the airplane, no. But you know, it's always easy to take something apart you know, um, when we took Marty's, when we took Marty's uh, Century Two roll servo out, what did that take, Marty? Maybe you know, twenty minutes or half an hour or whatever. And that was cataloging the parts, so he had everything available. But overall, he, we had to, he had to remove the entire Century Two autopilot. And you know, no, that that the installation time is not going to include removal. This is just putting the trio in. Yeah, uh, Greg, I was I was kind of careful with the uh, wires. I didn't cut the wires, you know, because they both had connections on the right. end of them. So, so I was careful to uh, undo each of the the eight clamps and uh, pull it back. Plus, I had access to my, right. underneath my right side floor as well, so it made it a little easier. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another question. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, does this include time to put the airplane in rig? Your airplane needs to be in rig before you install this. It should be in rig at the last annual, actually. So that's a that's not even a question that should come up for an autopilot installation, other than is it in rig? If not, let's get it in rig, which is not that hard and to we, do. If you've got the proper tools, it's not that hard. The hardest part is re-safety wiring the turnbuckles where they're located. Trust me, I know about that. I just and it. When we do an install, the very first thing we do or close to the first thing we do is we do a pedostatic check to make sure that the pedostatic system isn't leaking. Okay. <clears throat> so that's got, that's got to be squared away. But if you've got a recent pedostatic, you know, that won't be a problem because we obviously plumb into the pedostatic system. Right. Right. Couple more questions but from the chat window, real quick. Um, how well does it hold altitude, and uh, what are the average trim adjustments? Let me I'll, let I'll me talk address about that. that. Okay. Yeah, we'll let me, back to that. I'll later. Anecdo yeah, I can yeah, anecdotally. Like okay. Um, how? Uh, Let's see. Chris Barber asked, "How much less weight has that already?" I mean, I apologize. I just I missed the context. Yes, that was the answer. That it's a less than five pounds for everything. For everything. And, right. And Marty, do you happen to recall the weight of the autopilot that you removed? Uh, I want to say it was uh, um, probably right around maybe five to eight pounds, right around in that area. So about an even swap, you would say. It, 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 yeah. And the century was a little bit more because the the the, the type of motors that were used, um, but not a whole lot different. Yeah, you're not you're, you're trading you're trading ounces here. Yep. I just looked up the century three that my plane has, and they said it weighs eighteen pounds. Wow. Oh wow. wow. 
Okay, well, there you go. So in some cases, you'll get a pretty good gain. Um, is a control wheel cutoff switch required? Yes. Yes. On all autopilots. Yes. Good question. Yeah. Um, and actually, Mark had written that back into the text window, but for those by phone. Uh, and is that uh, cutoff switch included with the kit? Yes. Everything's included except the the circuit breaker, which, as we said earlier, is 15 to $20. Yeah. yeah. The question I've got, my plane's got altitude holding. I like hand flying, basically because I haven't been flying too long a time to want to wanna use an autopilot. But there is discussion on one of these Zooms about you get in trouble when your altitude hold is trying to keep you in an altitude and the thunderstorm is trying to pull you a lot higher and you it overspeeds the airplane trying to dive into the constant altitude. How does this autopilot you know, prevent that? Okay, the autopilot's got, it does have envelope protection in it. Oh, you, you want to address it, question. Question, or I can address it. Go uh, ahead. Let me, ahead. let me just, okay. It had, when, when you install the autopilot, when, when you set it up, you set up a minimum and maximum speed in it for starters, so that the airplane will not, you know, will not, yeah, you don't set up the top of the yellow. If you, if you, when you comfortably hand fly it, let's say you don't go over 175 miles an hour, um, you would set that as the maximum speed. So the autopilot will not take it over that speed. Similarly, you determine- Tell, 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 them, how we, tell them how that happens. I'm not sure tell, what them how that, uh, tell them how that happens, how it won't let you go over 175. Why don't you go ahead? I, the I, 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 I'm. It, yeah, it'll, it'll, if you it reach that, if you have it set for 175, you get to 175, the autopilot will bring the nose up and slow it down. Right. You know, it doesn't disconnect. Right. And, vice versa. Into a, into a, and vice versa. If for if it gets too slow. Yep. Similarly, the auto the the unit has built into it. It senses G's. And there's a certain, I can't remember what the max G load is, but it won't let it bake and exceed the max G's. It also yeah. has a safety provision. If you have a, a, a brain lock and you taxi out and you have the autopilot on, the autopilot will not engage until you, you know, you reach flying speed and then it'll engage. Uh, otherwise it'll disengage the servo. So that if you roll out brain lock and you have it, you have the autopilot on with some crazy setting, you know, like a 90 degree turn. It's not going to hit the power. It isn't going to take you off into the weeds. It, you know, it will not. Hey, Mark, let me, let, me add a, let me add a couple really important points to that. Um, and that is an incredible safety feature. Two years ago, when my friend Joe and I left Oshkosh in his bonanza, <laughs> we were lined up to, for, for, to, for, uh, next to take off. And all of a sudden he, he gets this white face and he says, my controls are locked up. And he tells, um, you know, the ATC or whoever's, you know, operating the runway then he says, look, I need to, I need to get off the runway. Something's wrong with my controls. Now he doesn't have a trio in his, he's got whatever Bonanza put in there, V-tail. Um, and so we pull off the side, we get back in line and he's looking around and goes, oh, my autopilot was turned on. It locked up the controls. And, that, and this is an incredible safety feature with a trio that it won't engage until, like Mark says, you're at flying speed. Now, another, the best safety feature of this is, and this is what Chuck at Trio has promoted for many, many years in the experimental world and it carried over to, G, to uh, Certified is that this is especially great for the VFR pilot. If you're flying happily along and your autopilot's flying your plane and you're comfortably relaxed, you're not overtired, but all of a sudden you come into clouds, you come into, uh, you come into a VMC condition and you're, you're lost, all right? Well, what happens within 20 seconds average of uh, VFR pilots that get into clouds? They go down. Uh, and so Chuck has designed into this with a simple push of a left or a right button. If you look at it, it um, Pete, pull up the first slide if you can, the very first one. 
What this autopilot does with a simple push of a button, it will, it, there it is right there. If you put the H nav or the V nav, that's the power on for uh, vertical navigation or horizontal navigation, which is also very important. You can control them separately. You can't on a trio, which I think is incredibly important. And I'll talk about that fine behind it. If you push and hold that button, if you push the right button for like three seconds and let go, it will make a 180 degree turn, hold altitude and get you right out of the clouds. If you push the H nav, the left button, it'll make a left hand turn 180 degrees and, and, and go on a reciprocal course at your altitude and get you safely out of the clouds. And from what Chuck says, he's got testimonials that it saved a lot of lives. It's an incredible feature. It's only featured on the trio. So, okay, yeah, go, ba go back to Mark. Yeah, you can also be flying v VFR and you're just hand flying it. And you know, you want to hold altitude, you just push the knob, you turn on the vertical the, the vertical pitch servo and push the knob in the middle middle, and it'll hold at the altitude you're at. And yeah. from there, if you want to go up, you turn the knob right or left, and it'll go up or go down from that. But it's I hand fly my little Cessna all the time. I hand fly the Cessna all the time. It's displayed for an altitude so, flight. Right. Yeah, and if you get the, and if you, you know, I'll be flying, hand flying the little Cessna, and I want to look at a chart or something, and you know what happens when you do that. You immediately climb or descend. And I just flip <laughs> the switch, hit the button, and now the autopilot holds the altitude, and, you know, I can read my chart. It's similar, I can do that if I just want to hold the heading. Now, on the... Yep. Uh, why don't we address the the trim thing? Because I think that everybody always asks that issue. And okay, you know, what, let, yep. I want to. So can you guys go ahead doing. and just read the the question, which is if you have electric trim already? Okay. Right. Or I'm sorry. Okay, let, let me answer that. a different trim question. But there. Uh, so go ahead and, and and answer your your question about the trim. But then there's a follow up question, which is not related, but which is just, if you have electric trim, how does that work with the uh, ProPilot? So uh, over to you. Let me answer that, get flying behind it. Go ahead, Mark. I was gonna say, uh, when we first certified the autopilot, we wanted to, you know, we, we wanted to test how well it would hold an altitude. Because obviously if the autopilot's holding your altitude, even if your trim is off, it's kind of an academic issue. And so we, the standard rule of thumb we have is in a 182 with an IO 550, the big engine, had it at 5,000 feet in this 182, cruising along in trim, pr pretty close to being in trim. Hit the altitude hold, locks me on at 5,000 feet. And then I began rolling in up trim. And I rolled it in and rolled it in and rolled it in till I got a trim down message. And the trim down message means that the, the auto, that the autopilot is getting near the upper limit of what it can hold. And then I would flip it off and typically the airplane would zoom up 600 to 700 feet. So uh, I, I know that's not scientific, but within a pretty big envelope, it's gonna hold you without trimming. Now, if you're in real turbulence, you know, if you're in real turbulence where it's really pitching up and down, yeah, you could get a clutch slip and then you have to trim. But typically in most, fl most flying, my experience has been that if I trim it, you know, pretty much within the ballpark, the autopilot will hold it from there. Um, you know, there is no auto trim in it. There is auto trim, for example, in the Garmin. And I've been told that that's what adds a huge chunk of time to their install. You know, that's the difference between 30 hours and 75 hours in install. And it frankly, everybody's concerned about it. It's the lack of auto trim is not a real big issue in, in the actual day-to-day -day flying of it. And Greg, you've got yeah. a ton of time flying behind it. I assume you had the same experience. Yeah, let me talk about it a little bit. I, I was gonna talk about that in the uh, flying behind it, but we'll kind of get into that now. My Warrior did have electric trim and the original control head uh, had the capability of tying in because of the experimental world had the capability of tying into the electric trim system. Well, I did that. 
okay, I didn't keep it, but I did it. And it was a simple thing to do as a two wire connection to my trim motor, but I didn't keep it because I didn't need it. Um, the, what you're seeing on, the, on this first page here where the, where the um, LED display is, it'll tell you trim up, trim down. And that's because of the smart servos. It's putting a force required the motor's trying to trying to move, and um, it's saying there's a force on it. You need to trim it. Well, if you don't trim it, it's like Mark said, it's still going to fly the plane. It's going to keep it at five thousand feet, but it's going to slow you down because you're not in trim. But it displays trim up, trim down. Well, on mine, I had the electric trim on my yoke, so I'd tap it one or, once or twice, and uh, the trim light would go out. But typically, what I would do is I'd put I'd tap on the on the right hand side of my yoke disconnect servo disconnect and the plane would go up or down and i'd trim it manually and then i'd re-engage it simple i mean we're talking seconds to do this and um in a command sheet it's even less you reach overhead and you turn that thing one or two inches to trim it you know it doesn't take much in a command sheet to trim it out so it's not an issue it really is not an issue whatsoever because it tells you what it needs it'll say trim up trim down or if you make a power change an altitude change, um, disconnect it, and just hit the servo disconnect button. You'll you'll feel what it needs. I mean, every pilot can feel the need for a trim. Trim it, you know, the the one or two inches on your overhead trim, and re-engage it. Simple. So you don't need to spend the extra, you know, forty hours for the Garmin installation and the extra ten grand for an auto trim or whatever it takes. You don't need it. You don't need it. I, I didn't have to connect auto, it, but I disconnect. It wasn't cool. It was. I had to try it though. The the software, it's really easy. It would be very easy for us to add that to it. The problem is, again, going back to old school autopilots, all the FAA hazard determinations are absolutely fixated on runaway trim, and yeah, the the testing param. I mean, they were paranoid about it because old school autopilots would do a lawn dart on you. Um, yep. And so you know, the election has been made not to include it. It's there, but I mean, not to, to certify it uh, for this autopilot because there's the regulatory compliance issue with it. It's just not necessary. And most importantly, when someone's, someone's gonna ask about the minimum altitude issue, um, yeah. the combination of the easy clutch and the, uh, the fact that we don't have an auto trim that can uh, that can run away gave us a lower minimal operating altitude than, for example, True Track has. Uh, I think they're at eight hundred. Mark, feet just talk talk about that. Talk about how yeah. how it was determined <clears throat> that it had to be disconnected, and why others are different, and why this one's different. Okay, that's important. Yeah. So basically, what the FAA requires you to do. It, Yes, I'm in prison. I'm looking at a big Comanche Zoom meeting about the Chow Avionics autopilot. What? I'm sorry, we got. Am I back on? Yeah. Hello? Okay. In other words, uh, go ahead. In any event, the FAA requires you to demonstrate with, they talk about, quote, an average pilot. And what we did is we enlisted a 250 hour private pilot, we know fairly new private pilot. And we had to go up and we flew approaches. We, the software in this thing is not capable of running away because we don't have an auto trim. So we had to come up with some zombie software to make it <laughs> mimic a running away trim. And we had him fly, uh, you know, an RNAV approach. And while he's flying the RNAV approach, then we would trigger the zombie software so it would pitch down hard. And <clears throat> what we had to do is do, you know, no notice to him. We had to record you know, how much altitude he lost in recognizing and correcting. Well, the minute it pitched down, he did what any pilot, pilot do, normally would do is come back on the yoke. And because the, the clutch is so light, you don't have to hit the interrupt. You just come back on the yoke. We were getting consistently, you know, total lost altitude of 50 feet, 60 feet, you know, minimal stuff. 
Um, and so the FAA initially told us that uh, they weren't going to put a minimum altitude on it. It then went to the flight test department and the flight test department says it's an autopilot. It's a non TSO autopilot. You have to have a minimum altitude and they arbitrarily came up with 500 feet. I can represent that we've been in very active discussions with the FAA and the people who have the biggest input, the flight test people are advocating for us that we don't have to have the minimum altitude. But at the current time, it's a 500 foot minimum operating altitude. Uh, the the non-TSO competitor true track sure. is 700 or 800. You're gonna put it in here? And, yeah, it's 700. Uh, and that's yeah. 70. Yeah. And that's because their servo is, you know, is more of the old school type where, you know, we, yep. they don't have an auto trim either, but their, their servo is harder to uh, control. You're going to lose more altitude. That's the story of it. You have, we are you pretty have to disconnect the servo with a push button before uh, you On the that. track, you do. Yeah. On yes, ours, correct. you can override it. You can override it. Right. Yes. Um, and right. that's the story of, you know, why ours is lower and the people that, that have the, uh, the uh, authority or the responsibility for this function is the flight test people. And the flight test people are telling us that um, we, once we get past that, the, the software boogeyman, which we are working on right now, they don't have a problem with it. And other people are saying, yeah, but we don't know that there's some evil bug in your software that's going to pitch it down. And we're like, well, even if there were, we, you know, we did, we, we did the zombie software and put an evil bug in there. And we still only got yeah. 50 to 60 feet. Um, yeah. We think with our software DER, if we can get that, if we can get that little monster out of the, uh, the closet, it's going to A, take away the roadblocks been holding up additions to our approved avionics list and our approved models list. And it'll probably get rid of that minimum alt operating altitude. Um, Mark, I'd like to relay a, oh, thanks for that description. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I'd like to relay a question a lot of people have asked. Um, with this approval, hopefully imminent and the design complete, uh, are people who are going into annual able to get the uh, wiring harness so that they can get that part done while their airplanes open? I think we've been doing that. Yes. Yes, calls, you know, you know, call the uh, Jeff. I think we have been shipping the harnesses. Um, yeah, I mean, I believe we're so. confident. yeah, we've been shipping the harnesses. Great. So for um, everybody going into annual, um, and what else might somebody in annual want to get done uh, so well, that I mean, when everything's thing, finally approved? You're going to have to decide where it's going to go in the panel. The, the, the most time-consuming aspect of the, of the install in the Comanche is redoing your panel. You know, if you're gonna have to, if you have to change the racks, you know, to put in the panel mount, or uh, remove a bunch of wiring, that that's always a time-consuming, you know, deal, and it varies from airplane to airplane. So if you know yep. you're gonna be, you're going to be installing in an instrument mount, you know, you select your instrument mount and make sure you don't have a bunch of spaghetti behind it. And as Greg mentioned, we re-engineered so the the instrument mount, so it's not very deep at all. So there's almost no chance you're gonna have any conflict with you know, uh, chains or bundles of wires because it's only about, I'm gonna say three and a half inches deep. It's not real deep. Uh, yeah, and Mark, the big if there's an instrument there now, it's gonna be as deep or deeper than the, than the, the, the head, the round head. So it that's will- That's true, it's about to, not, it's less the, deep than a DG, much way less deep than a DG or an, a, oh, an yeah. artificial horizon. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's yeah, it's like a, it's like three inches deep. Now, if you're are putting both one of these, units, sorry, are both head like, units the same depth? The rectangular head and the round oh. head? No, the panel mount's a little bit deeper, but not much. Yeah. Now, not much. now, in addition to I that would, panel mount, if you're if you're going to use the rectangular panel mount, now you're going to have to install a tray too. So that's going to add some time. I don't think that. The rectangular panel mounts are nearly as popular as the round head, though. Is that correct, Mark? I would say that's right. Except that people with that have like um, 
um, you know, the real center stack, kind of the, the stack of 20 years ago where everybody had all their column stuff yeah. in the middle, you know, people yeah. want that. But nowadays the middle is being taken up by uh, a moving map and the like, and right. you know, people right. want to reserve that space for, you know, for a, uh, a screen. So that that makes the Instagram yes. much more popular. I would note yeah. if you are installing one of these in, let's say a Cessna or a PA28, one of the ones that currently do not use a cable attach, the install is going to run five to 10 hours more because you're gonna to have to mount you know, a bracket in the wing. And that that's the most time consuming thing on a Cherokee. Um, a right, little right. less so on a Cessna. The, uh, frankly, the Comanche install is the only thing simpler is the uh, Grumman. Because the Grumman, you put everything behind the, under the, uh, you know, under the back in the back seat and it's, it's 25 hours, but, you know, it's still, yeah. we're talking 30 hours, anybody can get this done. But, and the, and the important thing here is, is that this is universal to five different models of Comanches. That's the important thing where the Grumman is a Grumman. You know, this this will fit any Comanche. Otherwise, it could have been even made a little bit easier, but it's universal. Yeah, we're hoping that what? that the, the shops that do it once they uh, develop have done one, we'll, you know, we can knock them out in under thirty hours, and we expect that'll be oh, true yeah. for people. That and by the way, any A and P could install this. You don't have to be an avionics tech. It's this is not an avionics exercise. It's more of an A and P exercise. Absolutely. It's, it's a mechanical installation. Yeah. And you don't have to have, um, you don't have to have Trio do it, or you don't have to have the STC group, although they do do it. You can have it done anywhere. And what, one of our marketing items is that, uh, um, you know, we think we're really good in customer service. I mean, we have A&Ps call us all the time. And you you, our, our instructions have photos and we think they're really detailed, but there's always another question. And our IA just takes those questions and walks people through them. By the way, someone did ask about, yeah. is there a hassle with the yoke? Answer is no. Uh, if, you know, if we can drill it out to make it really neat and clean to install the AP interrupt switch, we do. Sometimes we just install a little tab on the top of the yoke to hold it. Um, on my own airplane, because it's so easy to override it, I have, I otherwise hate it. I've got one of those, you know, uh, damnable Velcro buttons, but that's what I use because I never <laughs> use the interrupt. If I have to override it, I can override it so easy. It's kind of like I comply with the regulation by having the Velcro button. Um, so no, you don't have to mess with your yoke to, to install it. Okay. Uh, one other let chat me, question. Let, let me move on. Oh, not any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, there's a oh, there's really critical here, chat question from Tim H that comes up a lot. We read it. Tim, hey Tim. Um, yep. And the question is, um, there's been a lot of back and forth on the True Track and Trio uh, are they allowed to do coupled instrument approaches compared to the Garmin GFC 500? Okay, the, um, it's, this is a definite, but, but, okay. Yeah, well, let's, there, we're, we got two, two things to talk about. Mark's gonna talk about capabilities versus legalities. And then I'll get into, let's, let's finish this off later with flying behind it and I'll tell you my experiences with it. But go ahead and talk about it because that's on every single forum there is, and it goes into depth, and and people people get upset and say you're you're you know you're you're breaking the speed limit. You're going 65 and a 55. You're going to get busted. So Mark needs to talk about the legalities and the capabilities. So go ahead, Mark. Give. I start off with first of all is there's a a definitional issue on what is a coupled approach. Technically, a yeah. coupled approach, as most people use it, means an approach to decision height or to minimums is what a coupled approach is. And because we have a 500 foot operating limit, you know, we can't do a coupled approach. Well, I've read on the uh, on all kinds of comments on the 
uh, on the chat boards. And they're like, well, that's worthless. That means you can only use it en route. And of course, that's absolutely wrong. I mean, what I routinely do with my Cessna is you file an LPV approach and it follows the magenta line, gets you up to the IAF. If there's a holding, you know, a hold, it goes around one time, you know, <laughs> makes a perfect entry. And uh, if you're at, you know, at the correct altitude, an intercept altitude, it captures the glide slope and pitches you down. Now, typically you do have to come off the power because you'll get a pitch down notification. So you have to come off the power and possibly pitch to descend, which you do in any event. And then it'll just fly the magenta line. Legally, legally at the present time, you have to turn it off at 500 feet AGL, which means that an LPV, a good one, typically you can go down to 300. So you're turning it off 200 feet before decision height. That's a legal requirement. Now, the question is, will it take you to the numbers? Yes, it will take you to the numbers. It's extremely accurate, but legally you have to turn it off at 500 feet. We've applied, uh, you know, we, and I shouldn't say applied, that's sort of a definitional term. We are, have had significant discussions with the FAA and on what further flight testing will be required to lift that. And we've pretty much satisfied the flight test group who really are the, the people we have to satisfy that the autopilot, you know, the autopilot will be safe to decision height because, I mean, if it does anything screwy, you can immediately override it. You know, that, that we always go back to that argument. And if you look at the most expensive autopilot out there and you go through the hazard analysis that the FAA requires, the, you know, the standard answer with anything going screwy is fly the airplane. And with our autopilot, there's nothing easier to do than to fly the airplane because a, a tiny little person with a three pound override can fly the airplane. Um, so the legality is you have to turn it off at 500 feet and functionally, that's not a functional limitation in it. The other question that comes up in it is will it do an ILS? It is GPS only, digital only. So it's, it's going to do LPVs, it's not gonna do an ILS. It has, okay. believe it or not, it was originally was designed with that capability in it. And in 2004, the FAA announced that all ILSs were going away. And so Chuck Bush, the designer of the software took the feature out. <laughs> but as it sits there today, it's all, we've only certified it with, the, uh, with GPS approaches. Mark, let me add a couple points. Um, you say you have to legally turn it off. Yes, you do for the regulations, but the regulations also say in an emergency use anything, to, anything available and that is available. Okay, so yes, legally, but you're, if it's an emergency, keep it turned on, all right? If, you, if, if you're lost, oh, to go yeah. around. You have, you have one now, gallon, the other thing gallons, is, a ga couple gallons of gas left and yeah. you have to land and yes. you're not comfortable, you know, you're wandering all over the place. God, yes, I'd turn it on and let me let it fly Absolutely. me the numbers. Absolutely. Now, the other thing is, and, and I say this to people all the time on the other forums that are, that are uh, you know, really against it, be, against um, the, these lower costs, I'll call them lower cost autopilots as well, it can't fly you down to the numbers. And I always say, look, if you're having it fly you down to the runway, this is not auto land. You better be in control of your airplane. You better be hand flying this airplane at that 500 foot level anyway. I don't know anybody besides the people that wanna talk about it on a forum, especially the Piper forum, which probably most of you aren't on, that why would you have the autopilot still connected, still driving the plane down to the numbers? It'll do it, but no, hand fly the thing, hand fly it. And I don't and know if, any, if anybody feels different it, about that. But. The beauty of the autopilot is it helps you get set up on your approach. It really helps you yeah. set, up, set up in your approach, but then you trim. I know in the twin Comanche, I'm busy as hell, you know, gear down, flap set, you know, making sure, you know, prop set. There's a bunch of other stuff going on. Yeah. And the autopilot's nice for that initial setup. 
But once it's set up, you're hand flying it. Uh, there's a Absolutely. question in the chat room, by the way, is what is the difference, if any, between the certified trio pro pilot and the experimental? Uh, the major difference is the experimental has, well, they both have a fuel flow function in it, but uh, ours is not certified to hook it up. And the experimental has the fuel flow function in it. Other and than I, that, and hey, I same. used it. I used it and it's an awesome system. It was, it was before it was removed, but I, it's an awesome system. It's perfectly it's, accurate. It's in the software, but we yeah. were not authorized yeah. to install it in the certified airplane. Right. That's the big difference. Um, the other, the other difference is we are currently, we have, and this is where our software DER comes in. Um, we have a version of the software now that makes the trio, you know, perfectly compatible with G5, GI275, and the Aspens. And the compatibility we're talking about is being able to enter altitude or a heading either through the setting bug on the trio or the setting knob on the uh, EFI. And, you know, it should be a slam dunk because we do nothing to the data. It just flows through. You know, the only difference is instead of going directly from the GPS to the Aspen, it's, it's flowing across the terminals of the autopilot. Um, the, that's part of job number one for the software DER is to get the FAA to understand that we're not doing anything with the data. Uh, he, he told me this morning, he thinks that should be an absolute slam dunk because it's kind of a non-issue. Um, but the experimentals obviously have that you know, are able to use that function right now. Now that doesn't, by the way, if you have an Aspen or a G5, a GI275, that the, the lack of approval as of today is not a reason not to install it. I mean, it's, it is not a big hassle to fly it one way or the other. You just have to, at worst case, you enter the heading twice. But if you're flying off the autopilot, I typically fly my heading off my autopilot, but I guess that depends on how you like to fly it. So one more question. Um, when do you anticipate submitting the twin Comanche documentation for STC approval? As the day that they call me back, that they've signed off on the single. And the reason we initially were gonna put it in together and then we initially thought, you know, we know they were getting overloaded. And we're like, we put the twin in with the single, it's gonna slow both up. And now we have since determined by process of deduction that the holdup was the software, the 737 MAX autopilot bugaboo is the holdup. Um, the, as soon as the single gets approved, you know, gets approved, we're just gonna install it in a twin, put it in an experimental and go fly it because the paperwork is essentially all done. We just have to go do a, a test flight and submit it. So, you know, let's say if it gets approved in the next two weeks, you know, we will start working on it, uh, you know, uh, the, in June. We won't have it done, won't, won't have it done by Oshkosh, however, for the twin. And I should note, I should note that we were all afraid last November that uh, flight test was going to come up with some onerous requirements for the sing for the twins. I don't think that's going to happen. I think worst possible case, um, they're just going to require us to engage the autopilot and fail a critical engine, and make sure the autopilot, you know, won't flip the airplane turtle. But of course, since it's got, you know, a uh, envelope protection, we're just going to set the minimum speed above VMC. Problem solved. Cool. That's great. That's great. Okay, um, any two other more questions? questions from the yep, uh, so this is, um, Rob calls it off topic, but I think it's a common one. Uh, can one install a trim switch on the wheel of a, a PA-30 that has, um, oh, I see, that has a Century 3 B1 um, autopilot? And the answer should be yes, Robert. It's a, it, you can have a separate, uh, in fact, Mark, do you wanna talk about this from your own experience? I have a trim switch on my PA-30, 
for the Century Three. I'm not sure what the issue would be. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean th that's the key thing. Robert was like, "Can you do it?" And Mark, what you're saying is, I have one already installed. So okay. answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's a yeah, place. So it's to, always been there. There's a place to plug it in. Is what I, you know, I, it's uh, it's it's sort of a like a ancient artifact, you know, and you never know. Uh, at least I don't. <laughs> so okay, thanks. Well, there was a separate electric trim system, Robert, that you could get. Um, John, I know that John Futter has an electric trim on his Comanche 260C. Um, right. R260B has a non-functional electric trim. So it was actually an, an independent system that you could get, uh -huh. as well as a system that was often uh, integrated. Yeah, but that's something I really, really miss about, about the, not having that. So my yeah. thumb kind of normally just twitches when I want to make a pitch command. Right. Yeah. Yep. And that's yeah. distinct from auto trim. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was just, you know, I, my twin Comanche, and I think, I, I think it's dirty, you know, 55 year old connections. I find that the electric trim occasionally gets a little spastic where it delays. Oh. And I end up just grabbing the overhead lever and lever and doing it. Um, yeah, I just call my autopilot my cranky old co-pilot. You know, I never know what he's doing. <laughs> I'm like a hawk, you know. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think my mine has auto trim because sometimes a, a little crank thing on the top it, it moves on its own. So I'm assuming it's auto trimming or maybe it's haunted airplane. I don't know. It's called the ghost in the machine, Robert. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the uh, Pat Donovan actually a reference heading. If you look at the autopilot, obviously the autopilot only has GPS information and it's flying a magenta line. So it's flying a GPS bearing to waypoint. So yep. it's, you know, it, that's all it knows and that's what it flies. Okay. And my, um, oh, yeah, Mark, my, uh, my uh, old co pilot is, is, is capable of it's slave to a electromechanical HSI. That's pretty cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mark. If you're inputting a heading from either an old HSI or a, uh, uh, an Aspen or a G5, for example, um, will, the, uh, will your autopilot track the magnetic heading based upon the lateral uh, input from the Aspen? Or is it going to just... Um, if we have no GPS signal for whatever reason, um, does it go and do nothing? No, it's going to, the, the GPS, when it gives you a, a bearing, it's, it's, it's not true, it's giving you a magnetic bearing because that's all the airplane's got, right? So well, that's what it's flying. Yeah, but GPS signals can be jammed, have been jammed in military and other reasons, or they just go out for whatever reason. If I want to fly a magnetic heading and I input that heading using my Aspen, for example. Under our soft, the software of, that we submitted for approval, you flip a switch for Aspen data or for the I my 172 has got an Avidine. I can get the data from the Aspen or from the Avidine. So if uh, you know if the GPS went out and I flipped it to Avidine, it'll be getting the, the heading information off the Avidine. It'll fly okay. back. Yeah, the Aspen, Mark. The Aspen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off the Aspen, excuse me. I misspoke. Yeah. Then you'll have magnetic. Right. Yeah. But I tell you, I think the the best feature of the autopilot, if you were to ask me on what, you know, for the typical stuff that I do, I'm not flying to minimums in this thing in serious clag. I mean, what it really is super nice for is, I think, is the altitude hold. And the altitude hold, you know, I can give a Cessna 172, it bounces all over the sky, it's a cork. And, you know, flying that thing when you're, you know, like, flying in the LA airspace, you gotta maintain your altitude. You could spend more time screwing with trying to maintain the altitude on a summer bumpy, bumpy day 
I just hit the, the altitude hold and it's nailed on that altitude. And if I want to hand fly, I can hand fly, you know, I'm hand flying it horizontally and I know it's going to hold that altitude. So I'm not going to get an altitude bust. And that's my biggest worry on instruments is an altitude bust. And this thing is within five feet, you're definitely not going to get an altitude bust. The other thing yeah. that's nice about it, uh, my twin Comanche, I put in, you know, has an old school 19, you know, yeah, 2000 year, you know, vintage, uh, you know, altitude reminder so you don't get a bust. With the trio, you set in the altitude you want to climb to and either the airspeed or the vertical speed you want to climb it at, you hit the button, the yellow and red light comes on and it'll climb at the speed you want and then just gets to the altitude, beeps twice and holds. It's very nice. So you can't Mark, get a bust. Uh, is, that, is that old school altitude alerter, a uh, little gizmo with a crank, a dial on, uh, you know, a little thing on it and it just yes. puts the digits up? That's it? Oh, no, that's the that's the real old school model one. Mine, yeah, I'm looking for one. Yeah, because I like it. Mine's, <laughs> mine's the LCD one. Oh. It's a, you know, Liquid crystal, it's like 1998 vintage. Oh, the one you're talking about is like nice. 1980s vintage. Yeah, the one that was where you flip the uh, numbers like a padlock, right? Yeah, those are It's cool. like a digital, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know the ones you're talking about. Yeah. Were you looking for one of those? Yeah, because I'm, I'm kind of trying to keep my, my, my plane is pretty capable because it's got this uh, GTN 650 in it and it's all hooked up, all the old stuff. So it kind of looks like a museum piece, but it's sort of a sleeper, you know, it's got that, that got a lot of other, uh, you know. If, if we do an install and yeah. somebody's got one of those we take out, I'll keep that in mind. Oh yes, please. We, <laughs> we always have boxes of old avionics we take out of people's airplanes. Yeah. I like to keep it sort of era, era specific, you know, and hide the real fancy stuff behind the, behind the panel. <laughs> anyway. I, 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 I really like the some of the earth specific stuff because that's what I learned to fly on. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, oh, the other the other thing about aspect of it, by the way, for those people who like to that, you know, don't fly super fast on the Comanche group. This really doesn't fit. But I, as I told CJ, I I discovered that my Cessna 172 went from being kind of a local only toy to actually being utilitarian because the, uh, the whole flight experience is totally different when you're sitting there for three or four hours, but at any given time you hit two buttons and you can sightsee <laughs> or be looking just for the, tra you got traffic, you don't fly the airplane, the autopilot flies the airplane, you're looking for traffic. You know, flying the uh, LAX corridor, I use that thing like right now because it'll keep me right in the corridor, right at the altitude, and I can spend all my time looking for the Yahoo and the PC-12 that's, you know, VFR at 200 knots, which happens unfortunately a lot. <laughs> Let me talk about flying behind it. Yeah, please do. Is, are we done with any other questions? Let's, let's move on here to flying behind this. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, is that okay with you, Mark? Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take you. Okay. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. Um, I just see some people are leaving and this is, this is probably one of the most important things is, hey, how does it work? You know, I mean, what, what, what are some of the other features and how does it really work? So back in the uh, PA-28 days, um, I was actually doing some flight testing for Chuck at TRIO. And um, one of, the, first, one of the, the, the things I remember first was he says, you got to try something. He says, he says uh, when you're in, in route, when you're just in cruise, he says, pull up, override the clutch, pull up, and basically do a power on, go close to a power on stall and let go of the yoke and see how it recovers. So I had a couple other guys on the plane with me, one in the front seat, one in the back seat, both about my, my size. So, you know, we were pretty heavy-ish for a, for a warrior. So I did that. I said, guys, beware. Um, we're, uh, we're, this is what we're going to do. It's after five somewhere. No, it is after five. <laughs> for real. 
<laughs> Wait till he gets off here. But it's such an interesting conversation. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, Chuck says, I want you to tell me how it responds. So I did that and it oscillated down, went below my set altitude, went back above it about halfway, went back down about halfway and leveled back off at my preset altitude. It went, it cycled three times and leveled off. It wasn't abrupt. It wasn't, um, it, it was actually very calm. He wanted to know about that. Now, one of the things that uh, the software has in it are called servo gains. And those are really preset by the STC group or TRIO, I don't know who does it, for a specific airplane. And that's based on, um, that's based on your um, airframe. And um, the, you can modify it a little bit if you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy to do. And that will hold your course from wandering and hold your altitude from wandering also. So once that's dialed in, it should be from the factory, it should be dialed in. So the first time I, I had to dial my own in because it was the first PA-28 to have it. First, first really true cross country flight I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave St. Petersburg and I'm gonna fly out to Texas. So I set up my GPS magenta line course with my waypoints and um, I'm, I'm in route and I'm up over maybe Brooksville and here's my first turn and my GPS is counting down the miles, then the feet to the turn. And lo and behold, I'm doing maybe a 30 degree turn or whatever, just banks into a left turn and follows a new course, right on track. Absolutely effortless, no change in altitude. Uh, this is really cool. So I'm flying all the way out to Texas. I got to do a fuel stop. All right, now I got to disengage it. Well, all right, disengage it to, to land, get fuel. And I noticed the whole time my... Uh, my, um, uh, tr by my trio head is showing me cross-track error. And I'm not changing by more than 0.01 to 0.02 cross-track track error from my magenta line. Now, 0.01 to 0.02 is like 60 feet, 60 to 120 <laughs> feet off my line. And that was max. And I'm watching my altitude. First cross-country I'm doing, I never changed more than 20 feet off my set altitude all the way out to Texas. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. And um, so one of the other features was um, if you wanna fly an airway, a Victor airway, well, some people don't like to fly basically straight on a Victor airway because of traffic. Some people also like me don't like to fly on the cardinal altitudes. I wanna fly 100 feet or above or below if I'm on a VFR plan. For that same same reason, I've had some close close calls um, to mid air strikes, and um, so I'm going to fly a little bit different. Well, for a Victor Airway, you can offset, or for your for any flight plan, you can offset a predetermined, a pre selected offset from that airway. If you want to fly 100 feet or a quarter of a mile or whatever it is, maybe not that much, you can offset it, and it'll still fly it, and maintain that that track. And that's really important. That's another safety feature. So when I get out to Texas, I bring my buddy up. I said, here, let's watch this. So we're flying away from his airport, Mount Pleasant Airport. Great place to go to see the Mid-American Flight Museum. Um, flying away from his airport, I said, now watch this. I'm going to hit direct two on my GPS. I said, here, you enter it. Enter, enter in your airport. We're maybe 20 miles away. So he taps in direct to um, his airport hands off, plane turns around, flies directly to his airport, doesn't change altitude, goes straight on course till I pre-select a new altitude. Um, it's just an awesome thing. Now here's, here was another cool thing I did. Uh, I installed a new engine in this Warrior uh, a few years back and I needed some break-in time. So I wanted to fly above my airport within 10 miles or so and maybe 6,000 feet and uh, and I didn't, I, I wanted to go up there for a couple hours and it's pretty boring doing just flying around in circles. So I just flew a big, big pattern up there. Um, you know, just a, a big rectangular pattern and announced to Tampa control that a T Tampa approach that I was, um, what I was going to be doing. And I said, okay, just uh, maintain your altitude. We'll watch it. And I didn't, I didn't touch the Oak for two hours. I used, I used the heading bug on the trio head 
and change my course 90 degrees at a time. Okay, I'm, I'm 10 miles down, turn it 90 degrees. It would turn, go five miles this way, another 90 degrees. I flew for two hours that way with a heading bug. So you can dial in your course uh, with a heading bug on the instrument panel itself. And it, it'll show you, it will show you two things. If you have a GPS course in there, it'll show your bearing to waypoint and it'll show your actual track. And if you, if you dial in uh, with, the, with a heading, I'm gonna call it a heading bug uh, because it's similar to other inst old instruments, uh, just align those two and it'll, it'll guide you right there. If you wanna fly it manually, or if you wanna fly it totally, totally through the GPS. The other, the other feature um, that I like to talk about is um, the two different functions where you can turn on altitude hold or your heading hold independently. And I think that's really important. Other autopilots, you either, either it's on or off. This way, if I'm climbing out of an airport and I want to hold my heading, say, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, energize, I'll, I'll, I'll engage the, the, uh, the, the heading, or if I want to do a, a, a vertical hold or a vertical climb and I want to steer the plane, I can do those independently. Or you can do them both at the same time. You can do, you can set your heading in, you can put your, you can put your um, uh, rate of climb in, it'll follow your rate of climb. If you, if, if you uh, say your density altitude is really high and you're climbing more than the plane is capable of, You've got your envelope protection where if you get close to a stall speed, your pre-selected stall speed, it's gonna pitch nose down. You're not gonna go into a stall if it's engaged. Um, a lot of really, really great features. If I'm VFR and I'm heading toward a cloud, all right, I wanna divert around it. I can either, I can do two things. I can tap the button for servo disconnect. I can steer to the, steer to the right or left to go around that cloud. And there's a button on the uh, instrument head that says that you're going to intercept. So it's a very simple, it's a, it's, a, it's a button on there, intercept. Push that button and it'll go back into an angle and intercept your original course without hands-free. It'll intercept it uh, at a, a slight angle. It's not gonna pitch you over. It's gonna bring you back to your original course once you get around that cloud, hands-free. Uh, what else, what else, what other features do we have, Mark? I mean, those are some of the some of the really feature rich um, uh, items that I that I like, and I've used every one of them regularly. What else do you think? Yeah, Mark? the independent servo engagement really is huge. I find yeah. I do that yeah. all the time. Just to, you know, I like to fly VFR, and I like to you know, I don't want to have auto doing everything. And yep. sometimes I want to have altitude hold. Sometimes I want it to fly the course. Sometimes I want it to yep. do everything. Um, but I think the, the other features feature, that they talked about. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. I said the no, feature I like the best is feature I like the best is just if I'm hand flying it and I, it's so easy and quick just to hold the altitude. You know, you hit the button, flip the switch, hold the button, and boom, it'll nail you wherever you're at. Yeah. And it just holds that altitude. I think it's, it's, I use that all the time, even when I don't even have the autopilot, yeah. the autopilot engaged. Um, I, I agree. I agree. Now, here, here's something that I really want to bring up. When I was first designing this for the PA-28, I've never flown with an autopilot before that. And I'm thinking, you know, I do some, I do a lot of long cross countries. I mean, we're talking California or, or Idaho or Colorado from Florida, it's a long way. And I, when I was in a warrior, it's a 110 knot airplane. It takes a long time to get there, but I like to sightsee. And with an <laughs> autopilot, yeah, you can sightsee. Well, I'm thinking, well, you know what? If I'm not actively flying this plane, am I gonna get sleepy? It's kind of like driving a car down the interstate. You know, you kind of get bored, but nah, not when you're sightseeing. Well, I found out immediately it's totally opposite. At the end of a, a full day of flying, I get out of the plane refreshed where before, man, I'm beat. You know, this, this took it out of me. I'm constantly looking around. I'm constantly looking at my instruments, holding course, holding altitude, 
it does it for you. I can look out the plane. I can see, oh man, I didn't see this before. Last time I came through this part of the country, it's flying it for me. It's like having a professional pilot there for you and all you're, you're the PIC, but you're now relaxed. You can look at charts. You can, you can do anything you want, you know, with it holding perfect course. You can't, you can't fly it as close as this does. There's no way you, a, a person can fly it as close as this does, except for my son. He's one of those gamers. <laughs> when he flies with me, he's like, not, he, does, he doesn't change one degree in course and uh, altitude. He's pretty good. But at the end of the day, he'd be tired too. You might be not. He's pretty young. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it in the, uh, in the twin, uh, particularly because it's turbo. And with the turbo, you're constantly watching those engines, constantly monitoring temperature. And when you're cruising, you know, it's to be able to have all the, you know, the altitude nailed and the heading nailed. If you've got the real engine management, you know, um, burden, it makes it possible to do that. Um, I can't imagine a real long trip using the Ray J without having an autopilot. I'm constantly no. looking at turbine inlet temperatures and the like. And uh, the, without the autopilot, guaranteed if I'm messing with the, uh, you know, finally trimming it and all this good stuff and adjusting the turbos, I'm going to be going up, down, or veering off course. Never fails. Uh, I can't imagine flying without one anymore. I, I, I mean, it's such a safety enhancing piece of equipment. Uh, and it just makes you a much, much better pilot. When you're going through a controlled airspace and you're talking to ATC, they recognize that you are on course on altitude and that's really important. It really is. Makes you a much better pilot. I am flying my plane down 4,500 feet over the Tennessee Hills, you know, 23 going about 165. It's a lot of fun, but two, 300 feet up, 200 feet, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, really, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that little, little little toggle switch on the dashboard makes makes you a better pilot when you're riding with other pilots. <laughs> Good you're point. right. Yeah, particularly now with ADSB tattling on us, um, <laughs> I really like it. I really like it. Uh, haven't seen the statistics yet, but I got to believe that a lot of more people are going to get any letters on altitude issues now that they know exactly who it is. Um, and, you know, basically even on VFR and Class B airspace, it's an IFR environment. And when they give an altitude, it's an IFR altitude. Yeah. Mark, can you talk to the avionics that the Trio Pro Pilot will work with or integrate with, and if you could answer the practical answer and the formal answer, that would be great. Well, oh, I'm glad you mentioned it because the software DER, the probably the singularly craziest issue we came ran into with the FAA is that you know there's new, as we all know, there's new GPSs coming on the market like the Garmin 175 and the 375. Their outputs are absolutely standard as can be, no different than a, you know, a GNS 430 was back in 2003. And we were, you know, we've had a holdup on getting the new autopilots added to our approved avionics list. I firmly expect that that will be done next week. Um, because it turns out that the way Bendix King as they're set up, they let the customer go up, fly it, submit paperwork, and the FAA accepts it. So we, of course, had we had to ask the question, if they can have a customer go up and just submit the paperwork that it works great with a Garmin 175, um, tell us why we have to put it in experimental and fly it with a designated test pilot. And they don't have an answer to that. And... Uh, um, the DER has told us he should be able to get that resolved next week for us. Um, so essentially right now, I mean, the usually it's been the other end people ask about is, you know, what will it fly with? Well, 
if you go back to like the generation of a KLN 89 or 94B, it won't work with those because their processor, well, it will, but it won't work well. Their processor is so slow that uh, you start getting the autopilot wanders. But anything made, including a handheld, you know, made after about 1996, it'll fly with it fine. Um, so the 430s, say, 530s, the 500s. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. And, the, and if you're talking you know, like the 396 handhelds, you know, the two th year 2000 vintage handhelds, uh, there's probably a thousand experimentals out there flying on those and they fly fine. You know, obviously, if you're on something that's WAS enabled, then it'll do glide slope and vertical. And, uh, you know, you can do the approaches. That's which most people want, obviously. Um, but you don't have to have a WAS GPS to fly it. What about GNS the GNS 480? Yeah, of course, you'll fly on that. Yeah, the GNS 480 is a great unit. You know, yep. Garmin bought bought Apollo and then killed the better technology. It's kind of like beta versus VHS, right? All right. Uh, yes, it works. Uh, we have installed it with on several airplanes with 480s. And it, it, it is the same data and it flies fine with it. Um, yeah. The only one right now, the, the only one right now that is not approved as of today is the 175 and the 375. And there's zero reason that they haven't approved it. That's why We've asked the DER to uh, politely, you know, kick some tires and tell people to get it back to us. So and what happens, what does it mean that it's not approved? Like what, you know, if it's working, what, what does approved mean from us, for us practically? In the um, real world, I'm not sure, to be very honest. Just legally, we have an approved avionics list and it's the list, it is the list of avionics that we are authorized, that of certified avionics, that we are authorized to connect the autopilot to. Um, so Greg so, flew all over the country with the pro pilot for the Cherokee coupled to his handheld GPS, and that obviously worked great. So it, it, it's on our it's 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 on our approved list. All oh, those it handhelds is. we've got. Oh yeah, uh, all that stuff's all approved. Oh okay, because got it. it was all demonstrated. It was demonstrated, you know ad nauseum in the experimental community. And where the issue, the issue is engineers at the FAA that aren't familiar with the basis under which we were approved was, you know, do you have a demonstrated reliability? And the question that was being asked is, well, you don't have a demonstrated, you know, reliability with a Garmin GNS 175 to which the response is, yeah, but we have 10 million hours of response of demonstrated reliability, flying off, you know, the uh, RS-232 and Air Inc. 429, and that's exactly what we're getting. And Got it. the software engineer, software engineer just laughed. He was, he was, he was surprised. And that's, that's what prompted me to say, yep, we're using the wrong grade of aluminum with the software. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the engine, we just, we're not dealing with software engineers, bottom line. They're great guys, yeah. but it's, it's not, and they're the first to admit that it's not their shtick, but see what happened is, uh, this is surmise, you know, after the uh, 737 MAX, you know, the FAA told anybody, you're touching an autopilot, you better be sure that it can't do this, 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 and this. And the ACOs typically have, if they're lucky, have one engineer who's a software engineer. Um, so the other engineers know it's a, it's a real big sticking point, but you know they're not in the ability, the position to approve it. Um, the big guys have on staff, you know, software DERs, so they give it to their like Garmin gives it to their software, your know, DER. He looks at it, laughs, and says, "Yeah, it's a non-issue." The FAA accepts that. We don't have the two hundred thousand dollar a year software engineer. I finally hired a consultant that's got a terrific relationship with the Chicago ECO. And got it. he's going to carry it. That He's going to do that for us. I, in fact, he I said guess today, these software DERs are getting more and more yeah. important with today's avionics. Well, yeah, because, well, because he basically just has to hold somebody's hand 
and just say that when we submit the document saying there is no freaking issue, that we're not bullshitting them. There's no freaking issue. And <laughs> they'll accept that because they're the ACO software engineer knows this, you know, this DER. And of course, being a DER, his certification is per se accepted by the FAA. Excellent. And um, one question, we've covered um, GPSs. And uh, the other question that's coming up is DGs. So legacies and also the G5s and the uh, GI-275s and possibly the UAvionics AV-30s. How do right. those tie in? Well, I just, that, that's, our DER is doing that right now. I mean, we've, we have submitted a request to add the G5, the Aspen E5, the Aspen PFD 1000, 1000 Max, and the GI-275 to our approved avionics list. It should be a, a non-issue because it's all the same standard data. But again- But not legacy use, DGs. Legacy so, analog DGs, no, because it's all analog. You know, it's good. Right. Like if you have a, a KI-525, you know, the KI-525, I if you had an analog converter, it probably would work. You know, an ACU. So could we get the Garmin GAD 29B analog to digital converter and use that to, to use our old standard DGs with the ProPilot in I, theory? Ants, the answer is in theory, it should work. We have, you know, until we get them to sign off on the no brainer, um, because we've looked at that. I mean, you look at the Aspen, Aspen's got their ACU2, just puts out a digital output that's identical to what you're getting off of G5. So it's, again, but in it's reality, the data. you would have to have it approved. Right. <laughs> like I say, it's the wrong grade of aluminum. <laughs> So I got yeah, a right. software DER to, to yeah. present to them that it's not an issue. Uh, if there's a real market for that off the analogs, you know, you will do it. I, you know, we have not focused on that. Uh, you know, I have an analog KI-525 in my twin Comanche and the plan always has been, you know, I'm so used to it and I like it, but at some point in time, I'll upgrade to, you know, upgrade to glass. But if there's a lot of people that are going to stick with that technology, then it'd probably be worth our while to do it. So in theory, there's nothing that's going to, all that's needed is a digital to analog converter between the uh, analog DG and the ProPilot input, and it will work. I'm probably speaking above my pay grade because I'm not an engineer, but my understanding is correct. That should work. Well, it is 10.03, um, and so let me just <laughs> take a moment to, um, yeah, if, if we did not properly answer your question in the chat window, could you please just type a quick note into there, and uh, we'll make sure that Mark and Greg, you know, answer and, and put a frequently asked question out to everybody. I want to just really uh, thank, and particularly Greg, with your experience flying behind the pro pilot, and Mark, your experience flying behind the pro pilot in your airplanes, and these these legal versus practical questions have been all over the place. Um, thank you so much for an amazing, informative session. Nobody else could have done this but you guys. Uh, well, but I want I want to thank the team and particularly the Comanche com community depositors. I mean, we are, <laughs> we are terribly apologetic that we had all this stuff done in January and nothing's happened. And we've just been frantic trying to get this, to get the FAA to move. And we could not figure out what the problem was. And now we think, and again, this is surmise. I don't know this to a certainty, but the, it appears it's concern about the software. Um, and so we're going to, att we're attacking that directly. You're expecting news possibly as soon as next. Well, you're, you're actually you're expe you said that you're actually really expecting news next week. Have they given you a pretty solid guess as to when? Well, we submit the only pushback they had on the Comanche. The only pushback is they said we want you to add a section in your cert plan 
that right up front lists the hardware by part number rather than having it only in an attachment. That's obviously was not hard to do. So and that's all now done. Just that getting, was done ages ago. That, yeah, that's all done. That's, that's, so it's right now uh, the engineer that was, you know, every time we talked to him, he had software questions, and we were like, we got to get him off the software issue. Um, it's not his daily work. He's the first to admit it. it's not his daily work. And Jeff this morning had a discussion with him and said, okay, we've got the software DER that you guys like and have worked with. If when he gets on it tomorrow, will you be able to put the command sheet back on the top of the desk and do it? And he said, yes. So I'm highly optimistic we can get this moved. Well, let all those people in the ACO know that there's a hundred command sheet pilots just sitting there waiting to blow champagne corks and send them flowers and chocolates. <laughs> and once it's, a, because once it's approved, so they, you know, the, on our Gantt chart, the holdup is, um, once it gets approved, then Chuck Bush, Chuck Bush is going to have the PMA. Then Chuck Bush can tell Greg to start making, you know, 300, 300 cents of parts or whatever. And, and we, we, we can't we, issue stuff until we have the PMA. We can't issue stuff. We have to have the approval. Good deal. Sounds imminent. Sounds imminent. At this point, I'm going to Good end point. the recording. Good Those of you that... Uh, Want to check out what was going on that you get out what was going on that you you can uh, you can get there to tomorrow uh, mid morning it'll be on the website and you can take a look on the website and so so Pete Morris Pete I'm going to say good night okay hey, Pete. and I'm going to say good night too and thanks everybody thank you CJ thank you for thank you Pete for hosting this and I think. Uh,